What up guys, Otterpop here. So many of you have suggested it, and you know what? I'm actually really excited for this one as well. I love Lemmy Knows videos. Well, it's especially the ones he does on various, you know, forensics-related cases. I mean, just look at the Love Pass case. I mean, Jack the Ripper. Oh my god, Jack the Ripper was such a good video of his. But recently he put out a new video related to the JFK assassination. And apparently, it's over an hour long. No, 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 what am I talking about? I'm pretty sure that the Jack the Ripper one was just over an hour long. This one is over an hour and a half long. Now, if you're just looking for somebody to watch this, go elsewhere. That's, uh, that, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm here for. For those of you who know my channel, you know. You know when it comes to forensic stuff, I am all over this. I guarantee you... My analysis alone of this video is going to be just about as long, if not longer, than the actual video itself. I almost guarantee you. And if not, I guarantee you there'll still be an hour of commentary and analysis. Because again, this is fascinating stuff to me. All kinds of cold cases. That stuff is really fascinating to me. But yeah, let me, let me know has has outshone himself. Well, I can't say that yet because I haven't watched the video. But he has outshone himself yet again, most likely with a video that's over an hour and a half long, just on the Kennedy assassination. Oh my, like, that, 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 that's just mind-boggling. That's absolutely mind-boggling to me. I don't know, but whatever the case, I am going to watch this, and I am going to see just what Lemmy now has to say about this incredibly famous and very tragic assassination. Just let me know. All right, what you got? Ooh. Oh, that's a cool diorama. Right yep. about here, Dealey in Plaza. Dallas, Texas, American President John F. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Mm -hmm. The accused assassin was a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. Yep. After being held in custody for less than two days, Oswald himself would meet a violent end. Very violent, yep. According to a subsequent investigation, Oswald had fired three rounds from the Texas School Book Depository. Police recovered three shell casings yep. and a bolt-action rifle from the sixth floor of the building. Yeah, I want to say that th there, 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 there was some interesting case analysis with the bullets that were fired. I mean, everybody knows about the whole magic bullet theory, but there were so many witness statements that couldn't really determine if two shots were fired or three like people kept either going back and forth or they weren't or they couldn't hear things properly but there was the, the, there were so many witnesses who said they heard two shots there were so many who said they heard three and so people didn't necessarily know for sure and of course there's this whole magic bullet theory where i'm sure there are dozens of images online where the bullet takes a path and then immediately curves into this weird amalgam and hits both Kennedy, who's in the back seat, and the individual who's in front of him in the right-hand passenger side. I don't remember who that is. It's just crazy, the kinds of conspiracies that people believe in, like, like somehow physics doesn't even exist. I mean, even before more official reports were released in the last year or two, I think, honestly? The last five years for sure, there were some new reports that came out that sort of solidified what happened during the Kennedy assassination. But as far as I am aware, based on the laws of physics and how guns work, not by bullets, just going wherever they damn will please and defying the laws of physics completely, but there were two shots fired for sure that did hit Kennedy and or people around Kennedy who were in the same car. The first, I want to say, hit Kennedy somewhere in the chest and essentially tracked through him into the passenger in, in the right front seat ahead of him. The second shot that hit Kennedy is the one that, that hit the back of his head, I want to say, and essentially blew out his brain. Or was the, no, 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 it was, not, it was not the front. It was the back. It was definitely the back. But yeah, theoretically, the first shot that hit Kennedy, he might have been able to survive. But after he got shot in the head, no way in hell. No, no chance. No shot at all. But yeah, I want to say based on the positioning 
that was determined is that Kennedy was sort of was in the back seat on the right side. He was practically on the edge of the car, and the passenger in front of him was in the front seat, and he was slightly to the left. That would explain the trajectory based on the location where the shots were actually fired in the book depository, I believe. And then, and yeah. I mean that's uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much the simple gist of it. There's no conspiracy. I mean, yes, technically there was in a way a conspiracy to assassinate the president, which was one of the only ones in history to actually succeed in American history. That is, other than the guy who actually wanted to shoot Kennedy, <laughs> there, there really is no conspiracy. It's it, it's it's pretty cut and dry, if you ask me. I've always figured that was the case. Even when I was 10, 15 years old, I figured that that was the case. It was just simple, cut, and dry. There was no weird conspiracy, no laws of physics being broken, nothing of that sort. Police recovered three shell casings mm -hmm. and a bolt-action rifle from the sixth floor of the building. Yep. But the shooting of Oswald sparked immediate suspicions of conspiracy. Oh, it did. Suspicions that so persist many. to this day and have driven most Americans to reject the government's conclusion <laughs> Oswald acted alone. The arguments for and against conspiracy take many shapes and forms. Oh, and far yes. Far too many, in fact, to do them all justice in a single video. Mm -hmm. Is that in this video, I want to zoom in and focus on a very narrow slice of this case. Oh. Specifically, the events surrounding the Texas School Book DePaul story. What exactly oh. happened inside this building from where the shots that killed the president are believed to have been fired? Oh, so this is a focus on the book to... And it's still an hour and a half long? That's insane! Oh my gosh! By the way, that... Okay, so that is an interesting point of contention. Is whether Oswald was acting alone or not. Now, granted, I haven't looked super in-depth on this, but in my immediate opinion, without knowing too much information, my opinion could change by the end of this video. I'm not entirely sure, because my, my thought process is still a little bit loose on this. But I'm willing to bet that Oswald either acted alone, or there was maybe one other accomplice. I'm kind of on the fence, because, again, I don't know... A lot of the facts, I have not studied this particular aspect of history in depth. And I'm, I'm still open to interpretation and facts, of course. But I don't know for sure. But my first thought is that he worked alone, or there's maybe another accomplice. I don't know. Again, my opinion could change by the end of this video. But we have to watch in order for me to determine if my opinion will change or not. I'm loving this music. Heck yeah. It's got a good beat to it. In September of 1963, a young man named Wesley Frazier received a call from an employment agency. There was a potential job opening at the Texas School Book DePaul story. Oh. On September the 13th, Frazier made his way from Irving, Texas. Ten weeks before the down shooting. To Central Dallas. Oh, wow. He met with Roy Truly, the superintendent of the building, and was hired on the spot. Interesting. Back in Irving, Fraser lived with his older sister, Beanie Randall. Hey, siblings! A few houses down the street lived a woman named Ruth Payne. Well, this is quite the deviation. The 14th, I'm sure there's a reason, both though. Randall and Payne had a cup of coffee at the house of a neighbor. Payne brought along a friend and Russian immigrant named Marina Oswald the wife of Lee Oswald. Oh. Marina could barely speak any English and had been staying with Payne for a few weeks, partly due to her husband's unemployment. The subject of Lee looking for work and that he hadn't found work for a week came up while we were having coffee. And Mrs. Randall mentioned that her younger brother, Wesley Frazier, thought they needed another person at the Texas School Book Depository where Wesley worked. Oh. Payne and Marina returned See home, the connection now. spoke with Roy Truly over the phone, and secured a job interview on behalf of Lee Oswald. Oh. The following morning, he went down to the Book DePaul story and began his first day of work <laughs> on October the 16th. I think I did know that Oswald worked at the depository for a certain amount of time, but I didn't know much more than that. I didn't realize that he had actually been unemployed for a long time, 
so yeah, this this is going way far back in time. This was, uh, well, in, in terms of, you know, at least when he got an interview secured, what is it, 39 days, I think? Which, I mean, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a solid, I'm trying to math right now, that's a solid, like, five and a half weeks before the actual assassination. Which means that there's still, like, five and a half weeks left to cover... Because, I don't know, there's a good chance that most of this video, I'd say probably about an hour's worth, if not more, is focused on events before the actual assassination. Because, you know, Let Me Know is saying that he's focusing on more of the book depository than, than necessarily Oswald or the assassination or Kennedy. I'm sure that the, 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 those little bits will be sprinkled in, but for some reason the book depository is more of a focus. That's an interesting perspective to take, because, you know, pe people more often than not usually focus on the big stuff, the actual assassination, you know, what was Oswald like, and, you know, was he working alone, or was he working w with a cult or something like that, or, you know, K Kennedy, the views of Kennedy versus Oswald, like that kind of thing. But to focus on the on the building itself, where the shots were supposedly fired from, which, you know, based on the evidence, pretty sure that they were, is a really interesting perspective to take. And I'm sure that was done intentionally on Lemino's part. So, good on him. The following morning, he went down to the book depository and began his first day of work on October the 16th. Oh, he was hired pretty fast then, huh? So, an acquaintance with whom Oswald's wife was currently staying had a casual conversation with a neighbor. That neighbor happened to have a brother who recently got employed at the book depository. This prompted his wife to ask the acquaintance to call the superintendent of the building to inquire about any vacancies. Quite the connections, huh? I told Mrs. Payne that to send Oswald down and I would talk to him, that I didn't have anything in mind for him of a permanent nature, but if he was suited, we could possibly use him for a brief time. This is also really interesting, too, because this this is a lot more recent than some of the other... some of, Well, okay, not necessarily, but he's including a lot of audio recordings for this. I mean, probably in large part because it was such a huge event where, I mean, it's ton dozens upon hundreds of people probably got interviewed related to this assassination. And... The f but the fact that they still have so many audio recordings of, you know, these testimonies is kind of crazy. And I like that Let Me Know has been including a lot of these. Because if you think about it, looking at the past cases, the Dialov past case happened, I th wanna s I if I remember correctly, which I think I am, in the 50s. But it also happened in Russia. And this was, you know, this was in the 60s. So, not too long after necessarily, but this was much more publicized. Publicized, that's the word I'm looking for. But then you have the Jack the Ripper killings, which happened in the late 1800s. So, you know, you couldn't really have any audio recordings of anything, really. And then you have the D.B. Cooper hijacking, which actually, I think, did take place in the... 70s? Am I remembering that right? Yep. Yep, 1971, so less than a decade after this assassination. But again, in terms of all those events, this was by far the most widely publicized. So yeah, I'm not surprised that they have so many audio recordings. And I kind of like that Let Me Know does change up the formats with every new video that he posts about this kind of stuff. And including a lot of these audio recordings, I personally like. If he was suited, we could possibly use him for a brief time. The position okay. was not only temporary, but only existed due to a temporary shortage of staff. It was the end of our fall rush. If it hadn't existed a week or two weeks longer, or if we had not been using some of our regular boys putting down this plywood floor, we would not have had any need for Lee Oswald at that time, uh. which is a tragic thing for me to think about. Wow. But it gets even more tragic because Oswald was not the only one to apply for a job. I might have sent Oswald to work in a warehouse two blocks away. Oswald and another fellow reported for work on the same day, and I needed one of them for the depository building. What about the other one? I picked Oswald. Huh. If Oswald was somehow entangled in a conspiracy, and the aim of that conspiracy was for him to become employed at the Book de Paul story, this roundabout sequence of events is a very strange way to go about it. Extremely. Like, you just look at all these connections. The curtain rods. 
What's that about? I'm, well, I'm sure we're about to find out. The Texas School Book Depot story was in the business of selling books. For a buck twenty-five right. an hour, Oswald's job was to prepare the books for shipping. He did so by filling out forms and transporting cartons of books between the upper floors and the first. Oh, the okay. building had three elevators, two staircases, and was seven stories tall. In the northwest corner, one stairway and two freight elevators provided access to all seven floors. Nice. A small passenger elevator near the front entrance stopped at level four, while stories one and two were connected by a second flight of stairs. So, so then the first four floors are, ac are accessible for customers, but the top three floors are not, is basically... Okay, because I, I, I don't know anything necessarily about the book depository, so I'm just kind of surmising some of this information. So the book depository is, is essentially transport for books to be sold. So then the book depository must have a lot of books in storage. So wait, if the first four floors were accessed for or accessible for customers, then then how did they ship out a lot of the books? Because one thing I, I do actually know a little bit about shipping and packaging and managing that kind of stuff. I'm actually sort of the unofficial shipping manager of my building. Granted, there's only twelve of us, but you know, between here and Florida, the UK, Germany, we we have so many locations that we're constantly sending packages to and from. So having our own little dedicated shipping area, which we really don't have, it's my cube at the moment. <laughs> but having that separated from everything else, not not just separated from my other coworkers' workstations, but even from customers, which we don't get customers, we're research and development strictly. So the only people that are coming in and out of the office are developers and engineers and stuff like that besides the point besides the point logically and management wise speaking you want to have your shipping area separated from the customers to the best of your ability look at a ups store sure they have a lot of stuff up front stuff that the customer can you know observe access purchase and then use for shipping and packaging purposes whether they want to do it now or they want to save it for later but there's also a huge area in the back that manages all the shipping material and manages all the packages and the envelopes and whatnot. But they want to keep that part separate from the customer. That, that, that's, a, that's a behind the scenes look that the customer does not need to see. And if the book depository is supposed to be a sort of transitional building of sorts or a traditional transitional Frick, I always can never remember the words that I'm actually looking for. If it's supposed to be both a transitional and a transactional business, where they're actively shipping and receiving various kinds of books, why are the first four floors seemingly dedicated to customers? Because customers can seemingly easily access that stuff. Am I missing something? Am, am I overthinking this? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm essentially the scrum master and the project manager for, for my, for my, de for my development team. So, this is the kind of stuff that I think about, alright? I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not even sure if any of you fully understand where my thought process is going, but if you can, I commend you for being able to follow my thought process. If not, I don't blame you. <laughs> But it is just something that I'm kind of thinking about. I don't know why, but it's just something that was kind of not really clicking in my brain. A small passenger elevator near the front entrance stopped at level four, while stories one and two were connected by a second flight of stairs. I'm an idiot. It said passenger. Oh, okay. I'm... Okay, no, 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 no. I'm kind of an idiot. There's a difference between a freight elevator and a passenger elevator. A freight elevator indicates large amounts of cargo or large amounts of weight. Same general thing. Passenger indicates that there's only people going up and down. So my concern beforehand is a little moot. Okay. <laughs> For some reason, I I was I was starting to think along the lines of our our customers and citizens actually coming and going in this building. I didn't listen to the difference between the two elevators. Okay, knowing that there's a passenger elevator and a freight elevator on completely opposite sides of the building, 
that changes the game. <laughs> that may that makes my concerns irrelevant. <laughs> oh geez. Okay, so is a trans distribution okay. That's the word I was looking for. Distribution center. It ships and receives books. It's a distribution center. Okay. That that does make sense why there is a passenger elevator for people only and a freight elevator for passengers and or cargo and or merchandise. Okay. I figured it out. <laughs> I should have listened better to some of the words. I, th I thought I was. I thought I was being smart. I was not. Whoops. A small passenger elevator near the front entrance stopped at level 4, while stories 1 and 2 were connected by a second flight of stairs. This is a wonderful diagram. Lacking a driver's license, Oswald relied on Wesley Fraser to carpool between Irving and Dallas every Friday evening and Monday morning. He spent workdays at a rooming house in Dallas, while spending the weekends with his wife and daughters in Irving. Got but it. On Thursday morning, November the 21st, the day before the assassination. Oh wow, Oswald that was a huge jump. Deviate from this routine. Okay. I was standing there on the first floor getting the orders in and Lee said, could I ride home with you this afternoon? And I said, sure, you know, like I told you, you can go home with me anytime you want to. Like I say, anytime you want to go see your wife, that is all right with me. Lee had never gone home in the middle of the week before. So I asked him why and he stated that he was going home to get some curtain rods for his apartment. I asked if he was going home on Friday as well, and he said no. Fraser drove Oswald back to Irving, where he arrived unannounced at the household of Ruth Payne. Both Payne and Marina were surprised to see Oswald on a Thursday. They assumed he'd come to make amends with Marina due to an argument they had had a few days before. Mm. Did your husband give any reason for coming home on Thursday? He said that he was lonely because he hadn't come the preceding weekend, and he wanted to make his peace with me. Was anything said about curtain rods or his taking curtain rods to town the following day? No, I didn't have any. He didn't say anything like that? No. The next day, hmm. Oswald said goodbye to his wife and left the Payne residence about a quarter past seven. Atop a dresser in the bedroom, he left behind his wedding ring. Oh, Oswald okay. was next seen walking down the street by Lini Randall, carrying a package. He was soon joined by Fraser and the two of them took a seat in his car to begin their commute. When you huh. got in the car, did you say anything to Oswald, or did he say anything to you? I noticed there was a package lying on the back seat. I didn't pay too much attention, and I said, what's the package, Lee? And he said, curtain rods. And I said, oh yes, you told me you were going to bring some today. Not only was Oswald carrying a large package, but he'd forgotten to bring a lunch bag. When he rode with me, I say he always brought lunch, except that one day on November 22nd. He didn't bring his lunch that day. Right when I got in the car, I asked him where was his lunch, and he said he was going to buy his lunch that day. It's kind of crazy how much people remember about things like that. Because, you know, when, witness testimonies are kind of, are, are just always interesting. Just see, listening to how much that people remember. And granted, there are some moments where people will be confused about some details, or they may misremember some things, but there are so many people out there that just remember so many things with certainty, especially if you have a routine where you do pretty much the same thing almost every commute, every day, every week or something along those lines. If, if you do them around people enough, people will largely notice those kinds of things. I mean, I sometimes don't, but I also am not the most observant if I'm not actively observing. And I also do not have the best memory in the world. <laughs> but the fact that Frazier distinctly remembers that he had a that he had a strange package with him that's like, oh yeah, the curtain rise, you mentioned them yesterday, and he also didn't bring his lunch. Or Lee didn't bring his lunch, even though Lee always brings lunch. It, those little things that people remember, it just fascinates me to no end. Cause I can only do that maybe half the time. And of that half the time, half those times, it's important stuff. Actually, less than half those times, it's important stuff. And more than half the times, it's unimportant random stuff that I remember. Ah, uh, And it, it, I, I, I don't have the best active listening skills. I will admit that. But my memory is also 
random and selective. It remembers certain things, but not other things. More often than not, I remember things I don't need to, and I don't remember things that I need to, even if I'm actively paying attention. Because, for whatever reason, my, my memory just does... It, it almost has a mind of its own, in a weird way. It doesn't want to retain some things. So, listening to witness testimonies has always just been fascinating to me. Seeing how much people remember. Because, I'll be honest, I usually can. I'm kind of jealous of so many other people. Those are the two big things I'm usually jealous of, of most other people, normal or otherwise, is their ability to recall so many things at the drop of a hat and the ability to not be socially inept and awkward like me. <laughs> Those are really the only two things, though, that I'm, that I'm significantly jealous of when it comes to other people. Constantly. Constantly. Right when I got in the car, I asked him where was his lunch, and he said he was going to buy his lunch that day. They arrived in Dallas a few minutes before 8 o'clock. Typically, they would walk together from the parking lot to the book the Paul story. But on this particular Friday, Oswald grabbed his curtain rods and rushed ahead into the building. Okay. He was like, all right, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Just speed walk, speed walk. Working on the ground floor in view of the rear entrance was their colleague, Jack Doherty. Doherty. Did you see Oswald come to work that morning? Yes, when he first came into the door. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? The package, well, probably? Not that I could see of. Huh. Frasier and Doherty are the only two people known to have seen Oswald entering the building. Frasier says he was carrying a package. Doherty says he was not. No, no, hang on, hang on, though. Doherty says that he didn't see anything. That's not the same thing as saying that he didn't have anything. Those are two ex those are two very different statements that need to be clarified. And it's proven because that's an audio recording of witness testimony. Like if, if you say you didn't see anything, that means that you were looking at some at something or somebody and you can see what is and isn't happening. But just simply saying that you recall not seeing anything doesn't automatically mean that you didn't see something. So J -j just just want to point that out those those are those are two very different statements did he have anything in his hands or arms well not that i could see of frasier and doherty are the only two people known to have seen oswald entering the building frasier says he was carrying a package doherty says he was not contradictions like this one will become a recurring theme throughout the rest of this video yeah we'll take a closer look at the missing curtain oh that's kind of cool later chapter but for now, let's stay with Oswald. Yeah, again, two two very different contradicting statements within a contradiction itself. As the morning progressed, Oswald was seen working as normal. Roy truly described him as an above average worker who mostly kept himself. In fact, he was a bit of a mystery to his colleagues. On the way back and forth <laughs> between Irving and Dallas, did you talk very much to each other? No, sir. Not very much. He was one of these types that just didn't talk. Yeah, sounds like me. I was acquainted with Lee Oswald during the time he was employed at the book depository, but I never did get to know him well. He did not mix with the other employees and did not appear to want to make friends with me or any of the others. I was about to say, I thought that seemed a little bit more formal than this. some of the other uh, testimony. This was this was from an affidavit, so that makes, that makes a little more sense why it sounds a bit more formal as opposed to informal like with some of the other audio recordings. Not what I wanted to stop to talk about, though. Honestly, this sounds almost a little bit like me. Because I don't usually talk too much to other people. I just, you know, I, I'm just I'm just a little antisocial. I'm, I'm okay, I'm not as badly antisocial as I used to be. But I do get some social anxieties when either A, I'm around a lot of people uh, for a significant amount of time, even if I'm not talking to most of them. So, you know, events like concerts, going to the market, or like a, a farmer's market or something like that. Just, or e even a large party with coworkers. And when I say significant amount of time, even three hours can be a little significant for me. I mean, being around that people in close proximity for that long makes me a little bit anxious. 
or I'm just in close proximity with somebody for hours at a time and like either one of us is actively engaging in conversation or activities with one another. Even doing that can make me a little bit anxious and not exactly stressed, but uh, something close to it, I think, because I actually don't register, my, my, my mind and my body don't register stress very much, but anxiety is a little bit different for me. And yeah, it, it can be a little bit hard for me to to live with and interact with, um, you know, people I live in close proximity with. I'm, I live with my sister and my boyfriend, but obviously I don't necessarily hang out with them all the time because, you know, I just, I just don't. Talking to people for too long definitely riles up my anxiety. And I do tend to spend a lot of time doing my own thing, either, you know, recording these videos and editing them with my headphones on so that I can block out most other noises and I don't get as anxious, or I could be out in the living room and my sister could be watching TV and my boyfriend could be playing Tears of the Kingdom and I would just be kind of silent working on some art projects. I mean, that's a little bit more comfortable for me, but even that can get a little bit anxiety riddling for me. I mean, that's, that, 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 that's how my social anxiety works, at least. But I can understand it from this guy's perspective. And even when it comes to coworkers, I'm, I do kind of share some personal stories every now and then because I'm comfortable enough with them to be able to do that. But otherwise, other than occasional personal stories and then just doing my job, I don't really talk with my coworkers too much because I, I don't really want to. <laughs> I, 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 in a way, it's a little bit counterintuitive to my title and my job, but I do try and avoid... Okay, let me put it this way. I try and avoid unnecessary contact and interaction with other people. Not not, not just avoid it altogether. I try and avoid, avoid unnecessary interaction. It's probably a better way of putting it. Again, even though it's a little bit counterintuitive, counterintuitive to my job. As you know, a scrum master and project manager. But I never did get to know him well. He did not mix with the other employees and did not appear to want to make friends with me or any of the others. Did you ever speak to Oswald? Yes, sir. Did he ever speak to you? No, sir. He never replied to you? No, sir. Would you say he was unfriendly? Yes, sir, I would. Oh. But there were exceptions to his reticence, and one of them occurred on this Friday morning. <laughs> James Jarman was working on the ground floor when he observed Oswald staring at the window facing Elm Street. Oswald was standing up in the window, and I went to the window also, and he asked me, what were people gathering around the corner for? And I told him that the president was supposed to pass in the morning, and he asked me, did I know which way he was coming? And I told him, yes, he'll probably come down Main and turn on Houston and then back again on Elm. Then he said, oh, I see. And that was all. That's that's actually interesting testimony. Because, I mean, th that, 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 that could, that could, that could, um, that could indicate a few, that could indicate a few different scenarios. Is that Oswald could have, could have studied the route beforehand, and he just wanted confirmation, and, but he also didn't want to come off as suspicious. Or he didn't really know the route, but he did know that the president was probably coming somewhere around the area, but needed needed information from somebody else who might know, or would know. Or he knew all the details. He's, again, just trying to shift suspicion away from him. But I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, a little too, too little information, but th those are the possible scenarios that are happening through my head. Me, did I know which way he was coming? And I told him, yes, he'll probably come down Main and turn on Houston and then back again on Elm. Then he said, oh, I see. And that was all. It's a how brief, was, how was yet the... fascinating moment. Yeah, how was the it route publicly knowledge? Had no idea Public that knowledge. Would pass by the book to Paul story. This was indeed the case for some of his colleagues. Jarman himself had only been made aware of the fact shortly before he spoke with Oswald. There's no doubt that Oswald knew the president was coming to Dallas, but whether he knew the route of the motorcade is much more difficult to prove. Exactly. The route of the motorcade had only been finalized a few days before the visit and hinged upon its destination, 
Kennedy was supposed to attend a banquet in Dallas, but no one could agree on a venue. It came down to two options, the trademark northwest of downtown or the women's building to the east. One of the more vocal proponents of the trademark was Texas Governor John Connolly, and after much back and forth, he finally got his way on November the 14th. Okay. Had the women's building been selected, the motorcade would have sped through Dealey Plaza, east on Main Street, significantly further away and perpendicular to the Book de Paul story. Not to mention that First Lady Jacqueline would have been seated between the building and the president. True. The selection of the trademark meant that the motorcade would now head west on Main Street and make these turns through Dealey Plaza to reach the northbound lanes on the freeway. Ah, now, got it. These turns could still have been avoided had the motorcade continued like so and not taken the freeway. But since the freeway was the more scenic and expedient route, it was the more attractive choice. Got it. Okay, that, that makes sense. Say, the success of the assassination was largely dependent upon the selection of the trademark. It might huh. therefore be tempting to cast suspicion upon Governor Connolly, but it should be noted that he rode in the presidential limousine along with the Kennedys and suffered grave injuries. To oh Russia. yeah, this yeah. Not only that, but yeah, this Connolly was the guy was in front of Kennedy. To a motorcade and favored a more direct route from the airport to the trademark. A brief oh. trip that would have bypassed the Dealey Plaza altogether. He was unfortunately overruled by Kennedy himself, who wanted to see and be seen by the people of Dallas. He wanted to take okay, the scenic so route. Okay, all that was happening okay. behind the scenes, but yep. as far as the public was aware, there wasn't even going to be a motorcade. As late as November the 15th, the Dallas Morning News reported that the motorcade seemed unlikely. Interesting. But the very next day, the parade was finally confirmed. Huh. While the precise route followed by maps and detailed descriptions was not officially disclosed until November the 19th, someone familiar with Dallas could have approximated the route a few days in advance. True. That is to say, the earliest point a member of the public could have deduced that Kennedy would be driven past the Book de Paul story was November the 16th, less than a week before the visit. Here's the really dumb part, too. Why would this kind of stuff be made public knowledge? I'm, if you think about today's day and age in, you know, the 21st century, no way in hell would this kind of stuff be public knowledge or even surmised by the public. Uh, he, th th there, there's absolutely no way. The fact that even in... Oh, frick, what, what is this, 70s? No, this is the 60s, 60s. The fact that even in the 60s, this kind of stuff was made as sort of public knowledge or allowed for people for the public, at least, to surmise and predict what was going to happen. Red flags everywhere. So many red flags. I mean, it just, it just all worked in Oswald's favor somehow. Somehow. I don't, I don't freaking know, man, but <sighs> no wonder he got assassinated. The, the cards just slipped, all slipped right into place. There's th th there's nothing else that can be said about it besides that. That is to say, the earliest point a member of the public could have deduced that Kennedy would be driven past the Book de Paul story was November the 16th, less than a week before the visit. Yep. There's a good chance that Oswald saw these articles because he'd been observed reading political columns in the very same newspapers. Furthermore, we know from other aspects of Oswald's life that he was politically inclined. Well, that is I true. Have, uh, study Marxist philosophy, yes, sir, and also other that is very true. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Oh, I would very definitely say that I uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But uh, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. What is the difference between the true. two? True. Well, there's a great deal of difference. Such, several uh, American parties in several countries are based on Marxism, such as Ghana, uh, Ghana. Uh, certain countries have uh, characteristics uh, of a socialist system, such as Great Britain with its uh, socialized medicine. Uh, these, then, are the differences between an outright communist country and countries which adhere to leftist or Marxist uh, uh, principles. I thought, I thought Marxism was kind of a branch of communism, or communism was a branch of Marxism. It could be the first one. Hang on. Okay, so Marxism is actually a little bit more of a branch of socialism. I'm, I'm trying to remember what what the differentiating factors are between socialism and, socialism and communism. But Marxism was used as a basis for communism. But it's not. But well, communism isn't really a branch of Marxism. So the two 
they're not really interchangeable. They do have similarities, but principles of one led to a different one, but that's not that's not necessarily the same as a branch of. Okay. Okay, I got. Yes, yeah, so sometimes governmental and religious denominations they do confuse me sometimes. It, <laughs> that kind of stuff is not my strong point. I do know a few basic things here and there, but I don't necessarily know a whole lot. Conversely, a lack of interest in politics is precisely why at least one of Oswald's colleagues remained oblivious to the motorcade. So while it's understandable for someone apolitical to be taken off guard by a presidential visit, it makes far less sense for someone like Oswald. On November 21st, the day before the assassination that you were describing, was there any discussion between you and your husband about President Kennedy's trip or proposed trip to Texas, Dallas, and the Fort Worth area? I asked Lee whether he knew where the president would speak and told him that I would very much like to hear him and to see him. I asked him how this could be done, but he said he didn't know how to do that and didn't enlarge any further on the subject. Had there ever this been... was also somewhat unusual, his lack of desire to talk about that subject any further. How hmm. did you think it was unusual? Could you explain that? The fact that he didn't talk a lot about it. He merely gave me, said something as an answer, and did not have any further comments. Do you mean by that, usually he would discuss a matter of that kind and show considerable interest? Yes, of course. He would have told me who would be there and where this would take place. Huh. We'll never know what Oswald was thinking when he spoke with James Jarman shortly before the assassination. Well, no. But it is worth repeating, though, that Oswald was hired on October the 15th. That's a full month before the Motgate route had been decided, let alone announced to the public. Hmm. So was it just convenience and coincidence? It's entirely possible. That is, that is an idea. The sixth floor. Because, yeah, there were seven floors on the depository. On the morning of November the 22nd, a handful of employees had been assigned to install a new plywood floor on the sixth floor of the book depository. Every <laughs> once in a while, they would catch a glimpse of Oswald. I saw Lee Oswald shortly before lunchtime. He was by himself with a piece of paper in his hand. I had nothing to say to him, but some of the other male employees teased him and told him he ought to go get a haircut. Lee Oswald just laughed at this remark. Okay. Shortly before noon, it was time for lunch. For a bit of fun, they decided to race the two elevators down to ground level. As they began descending, they observed Oswald now standing on the fifth floor. He shouted for them to stop or to close the gate to the elevator upon reaching the first floor. Charles Givens then realized he'd forgotten his jacket and cigarettes up on the sixth floor. Did Oswald shoot from the fifth floor or the sixth? About to return to ground level, Given spotted Oswald approaching. Lee was coming from the window up front where the shots were fired from. Okay. Did you watch where he walked to? Well, no, sir. I didn't pay much attention. I was getting ready to get on the elevator, and I say, Boy, are you going downstairs? What did he say to you? I say, It's near lunchtime. And he said, No, sir. When you get downstairs, close the gate to the elevator. That meant the elevator on the west side. You can pull both gates down, and it'll come up by itself. What else did he say? Hmm. That is all. I said, okay, and got on the elevator. And with that, Givens became the last person inside the book to Paul story known to have seen Oswald before the assassination. Huh. At least, that's the official story. The encounter was fixed at 11.55, more than half an hour before the shooting. Right. But other employees claim to have seen Oswald in other parts of the building around the same time or even later than Givens. Givens huh. himself provided conflicting accounts. But oh. I'm getting ahead of myself. This encounter notwithstanding, <laughs> Givens was not the last person to visit the sixth floor. Shortly after Givens had left, Bonnie Williams grabbed his lunch and went upstairs. He sat down right about here to await the president's arrival. Now, when you were sitting by the window, could you see down towards the southeast corner? No, sir. I couldn't see anything as I remember there. About the only thing that I could see from there would be the top edge of the window, because the boxes were stacked up. Did you see anyone else up there that day? No, I did not. The huh. southeast corner is the location from where the shots that kill the president are believed to have been fired, the so-called sniper's nest. 
William says yeah. he was alone, but admits his view was obstructed by tall stacks of boxes. Meanwhile, down by the main entrance, someone was attempting to gain access to the building. I met an elderly white man at the entrance of the building who asked me to direct him to a restroom. The man was very old and feeble and could hardly make it up the steps. About five minutes later, I saw this man leave the building and enter an old Buick automobile with three elderly white women. Uh, the Buick then drove away. Did hey. you see him talk to anyone in the building? <laughs> no, he went straight out. This individual was never identified and hmm. is the only unknown person known to have entered the book depository before the shooting. Interesting. After finishing his lunch up on the sixth floor, Bonnie Williams heard the voices of James Jarman and Harold Norman emanating from the floor below. Feeling a bit lonely, Williams went down to the fifth floor and joined his two colleagues. The exact time of Williams' departure is unclear, but it was likely no more than 10 or even five minutes before the shooting. Huh. On the grounds below, this is conflicting information. Lined the streets of Elm and Houston. No shocker Every there. Once in a while, one of them would glance up at the book depository. Indeed, Jarman, Williams, and Norman were spotted on multiple occasions, leaning out the far east windows on the fifth floor. But movement could also be seen on the floor above them, a floor that, by all accounts, was now supposed to be empty. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, I didn't have too much to comment on there. Okay, so, hold up. So I thought, okay, I was completely wrong. I thought that, like, an hour, maybe more, would be dedicated to the time before the shooting. No. It was less than 20 minutes that was dedicated to the time before the actual shooting itself. Okay, so I can see where some of this conflicting information can come from. Because, you know, around this time, there aren't there aren't surefire ways to figure out timestamps. I mean, you don't really have video cameras. Not, not, not at this time, no, absolutely not. I mean, nowadays you find them all over the frickin' place. You, you could probably take down to the second when somebody did something on this street or that walkway, something along those lines. But during this time period? Yeah, no. Good, good luck trying to get, e e even, even, even in a 10 minute window. It could be a little bit difficult to surmise exactly what had happened. Because here's the thing, you don't pay attention to that stuff necessarily. Because just going about your normal workday, it can eventually become second nature to a lot of people. And you don't always focus on the time. And some people don't even have, don't have phone, especially during this time period, they don't have fo handheld phones to look at. They might have watches, but some of them might not. They barely have computers. Wait, were computers a thing in the 60s? Uh, I think? I know the internet wasn't a thing until a few decades later, but hold on. First digital computer. That doesn't help me. For public consumption? 1940s or 50s? Uh, okay. I'm not entirely sure if I could find exactly the information I wanted, but whether or not there were computers that were sort of publicly available to places like the depository that could tell the time, because this, the, 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 this entire thing was just all about time. Whether or not the people would be able to determine, like, you know, to the minute where they were at certain times. So in other words, no, they probably wouldn't. So no wonder that there are so many conflicting accounts about when people did this, and when they saw something or someone. Here we go. The actual shooting. Awaiting the motorcade by the east curb of Houston was a young, newlywed couple named Arnold and Barbara Rowland. Some 15 minutes before the shooting, Arnold spotted a white man in the westernmost window on the sixth floor of the book depository. The man was holding a rifle, his gaze locked at Houston. Despite standing a few meters away from an officer, Arnold chose not to report the gunman. What? Did it ever enter your mind that you should go and tell the policeman of this, this sight or this vision that you had seen? Really, it didn't. It never entered your mind. How? I never dreamed of anything such as that. I mean, I must honestly say, my opinion was based on movies I have seen. On the attempted assassination of Theodore Roosevelt and the other one, Franklin Roosevelt. And both of these had secret service men up in windows or on top of the buildings with rifles. Oh, boy. This is how my opinion was based and why it didn't alarm me. Perhaps if I'd been older and 
and had more experience in life, it might have made a difference. It very well could have. Wow. Do you ever have reoccurring dreams, sir? What? Do you ever have reoccurring dreams? Uh, yes. This is a reoccurring dream of mine, sir. All the time. What if I told someone about it? I knew about it enough in advance, and perhaps it could yeah. have been prevented. I mean, this is something which shakes me up at times. Damn. If Roland's recollection is accurate, it stands in direct conflict with that of Bonnie Williams, who claimed to have eaten lunch on the same floor at the same time. Williams mm. neither saw nor heard anyone, despite having an unobstructed view down to the southwest corner of the building where Roland claimed to have seen the gunman. Huh. A few minutes later, a different spectator named Howard Brennan spotted a white man pacing to and fro the easternmost window on the sixth floor. At half past twelve, the presidential limousine emerged from behind the building and began driving north on Houston. Wait. As the car made a sharp left turn at Elm, a high school student named Amos Ewens glanced up at the book The Paul Story and caught sight of a protruding metal rod. Hold up, this is interesting though. Because if Oswald really is in that far corner back there on the right side of the building from the view that we're currently seeing, he would have had it almost a straight shot to Kennedy from right there. Even with a slight angle, he almost would have had a straight shot from Kennedy. If Kennedy was indeed towards the right side of the... Actually, hold up. If Kennedy was more towards the right side of the car, and the governor in front of him was kind of on the left side of the passenger seat, the governor could have been right... Okay. The governor could have been right in the way of Oswald's shot at Kennedy then. So then... Okay, that actually makes a little bit more sense as to why Oswald... I mean, theoretically, if they're positioning a bit slightly different, he might have tried taking a shot at Kennedy while he was on Houston. But instead, he probably had to wait until the turn on Elm, which was going in a direction where Oswald still would have had the ability to get a good sight on Kennedy, especially now that Kennedy was in the back and there wouldn't have been anyone blocking him, necessarily. Especially from that height. Okay, that makes more sense. As the car made a sharp left turn at Elm, a high school student named Amos Ewens glanced up at the book The Paul Story and caught sight of a protruding metal rod. Here's another interesting thing too, is that if this guy was really trying to look up, or if this guy was, even if he was looking as the motorcade was turning, why would his mind go up? I mean, there could have potentially been some kind of glint on the barrel of the rifle, that caught his attention, so I don't- maybe that's what caught his attention, but... Whichever direction you're looking, what would make you suddenly want to look up? And if you're- especially if you might be kind of that far away, how would you just notice that? I don't know. Amos Ewens glanced up at the book The Paul Story and caught sight of a protruding metal rod. Yep. Sixth floor right there. Few realized what had happened. Was it a firecracker, backfiring motorcycle, or presidential salute? People near the Rollins even started laughing, perhaps feeling a bit foolish for being frightened by the ostensibly harmless explosion. Mm. Standing by the northwest corner of Elm and Houston was James Worrell. He thought the explosion had come from directly overhead. Sure enough, on one of the upper floors, Worrell could see the barrel of a gun. At that moment, a second explosion echoed yep. through Dealey Plaza. Worrell and Ewens witnessed the recoil and muscle flash of the rifle in concurrence with the sound. Wow. Brennan had yet to realize what was happening. He thought a firecracker had been thrown from the Paul story. He looked up and the man he'd seen pacing only minutes before was now aiming down the sights of a rifle. Oh yeah, everybody was talking Brennan about it. I could only recall hearing two shots, but his testimony implies he might have heard three. He confusingly said he saw the gunman fire the last shot, yet denied seeing the discharge of the rifle. Hmm. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, the rifle was seen by a handful of witnesses as the gunman cautiously withdrew from the window. The rifle, or what looked like a rifle, was drawn fairly slowly back into the building. And I saw no one in the window with it. I didn't even see a form in the window. Hmm. I could see his hand, you know, 
the rifle laying across his hand, and I could see his hand sticking out on the trigger part. After he got through, he just pulled it back in the window. Wow. He drew the gun back from the window, as though he was drawing it back to his side, and maybe paused for another second, as though to assure himself that he hit his mark, and then he disappeared. Huh. Neither Why the accounts saw the face of the gunman and could thus offer little to no information regarding his appearance. Arnold was quite some distance away, yet furnished a basic description of the man he'd seen about a quarter of an hour before the shooting. Wow. A description that was quite similar to the one provided by Brennan, who got the best look at the gunman. Ah. Taken together, these How do they know he got the best look? Of an assassin on the sixth floor of the Book DePaul story, taking aim with a rifle and firing at the president from the sniper's nest. This is another thing that is a little bit crazy too, is how can you tell somebody's age from a distance? I personally don't like to judge and I'm, I don't, for whatever reason, not a big fan of guessing games. Unless I'm sure that I can be able to pick out the answer based on logic. But what, when it comes to stuff like this, Oh, man, I hate I hate doing this kind of stuff. But I mean, yeah, looking at these descriptions, I mean, the fact that he was described as slender, white, dark haired and, you know, probably around average height for a guy is one thing. But def de trying to determine weight and age from a distance is so difficult, at least with other factors, you have you have a better basis. Like, yeah, you can usually tell somebody's complexion and can get a pretty good guess of what their skin color is. Same with their hair color, and even to an extent their height as well. Especially if they are next to something or someone with a more determinable height. But, man, trying to get somebody's age and weight from afar? I can't even imagine. But they really overshot with the age and the weight. Both Roland and Brennan. Even if Brennan was overall a little bit closer. Well, actually, hold on. I'm not necessarily sure, because Roland got the hair, Brennan didn't. Brennan got the height, Roland didn't. But Roland was closer to the weight, even though they still both got it wrong, and both of them definitely overshot on the age. But overall, shockingly enough, overall Roland's description was actually closer than Brennan's, even though Brennan probably got a better look at him. At Os er, at the shooter, Oswald, whatever. Taken together, these accounts paint a picture of an assassin on the sixth floor of the Book DePaul story, taking aim with a rifle and firing at the president from the sniper's nest. Mm -hmm. But other accounts leave room for a bit of doubt. The men in the window. Men? As in multiple? Wait. Hold up a minute. As previously mentioned, Arnold Rowland spotted a white man with a rifle in the westernmost window on the sixth floor about a quarter past twelve. But as yep. late as five minutes before the shooting, Arnold observed an elderly black man leaning out the easternmost window on the same floor. He might have confused the sixth floor with the fifth, where James Jarman, Bonnie Williams, and Harold Norman did indeed lean out the windows. True. In fact, they were the only black employees known to watch the motorcade from a floor above the first. Except they could hardly no. be described as elderly. No. No, definitely then, not. Take a listen to this. Will you describe with as much particularity as you can what that man looked like? It seemed to me an elderly black man. That is about all. I didn't pay very much attention to him. This question was then repeated to Arnold a few minutes later, at which point his answer had dramatically changed. He was very thin. Um, an elderly gentleman. Bald or practically bald. Very thin hair if he wasn't bald. Had on a plaid shirt. I think it was red and green. Very bright color. That Wait. Is I remember it. Can you give us an estimate as to age? 50, possibly 55 or 60. Can you give us an estimate as to height? 5, 8, 5, 10 in that neighborhood. He was very slender, very thin. Can you give us a more definite description as to complexion? Very dark or mm. fairly dark. Not real dark compared to some black men, but fairly dark. Seemed like his face was either... I can't recall detail, but it was either very wrinkled or marked in some way. Wait, 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 wait. The first time you were asked that question, you said you barely paid attention to him. And now you're giving a very detailed description? What the hell? That's, that's, that's mind-boggling. That come, like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if he's, he intended it or not, but that comes off as very suspicious. How do you not really remember what somebody looked like 
but then a few minutes later, describe him in such detail that he could be more easily identified. Like, pretty well at that. With all that information? Okay. It seemed like his face was either... I can't recall detail, but it was either very wrinkled or marked in some way. So, in the span of a few minutes, Arnold went from I didn't pay very much attention to describing the man's complexion, hair, clothing, age, height, build, and even the blemishes on his face. Yeah. Sometimes, exactly what I some said. Some people are prone to exaggerate more than others, and without in any way meaning to take away from the testimony of your husband as to what he saw in the building at the time, just from your general experience, do you feel you can rely on everything that your husband says? I don't feel that I can rely on everything anybody says. Well, this is really an unfair question for me to ask any wife about her husband, and I am not asking it very correctly, At but... At times, my husband is prone to exaggerate. Does that answer it? I think it does. Is there yep. anything else you want to add to that or not? Usually, his exaggerations are not concerned with anything other than himself. They're usually to boost his ego. Hmm. They usually say that he is really smarter than he is, or he's a better salesman than he is. Something like that. <laughs> as leading as that line of questioning was, huh. Barbara was not alone in doubting her husband's credibility. Officials at two separate high schools attended by Arnold explicitly warned authorities not to trust everything he says. He was characterized as someone who would not hesitate to fabricate a story and not tell the truth regarding any matter. He would not hesitate to fabricate a story if it was of any benefit for Roland to do so. What could have potentially happened was that Roland probably did see something, but he wanted to exaggerate and provide more detail to boost his own ego to think that he was actually helping catch an important killer or something like that. He wanted to make himself feel important by providing more details that weren't factual details in order to give himself some glory. Uh, ba based on the accounts that I've heard so far, that that's, what's, that's what most likely could have happened. That's what makes sense to me, logically speaking. He was characterized as someone who would not hesitate to fabricate a story and not tell the truth regarding any matter. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Roland lied or exaggerated on multiple occasions when he testified. That's pretty Another evident. Another who claimed to have seen a gunman in the book DePaul story was Carolyn Walter. Shortly before the arrival of the motorcade, Walter had seen a man with blonde or light brown hair in one of these windows on the 4th or 5th floor. Okay. She explicitly ruled out the 6th. It should be noted, hmm. however, that during the shooting, this window was closed with the blinds down, while this one, as you already know, was occupied by Bonnie Williams and Harold Norman. In any case, the light-haired man seen by Walter was holding a machine gun, and standing beside him was another man wearing a brown suit. Huh. Much like Arnold Rowland, Walter assumed the gunman was a presidential guard and refrained from telling the police. Huh. In fact, there's no evidence she told anyone of what she'd seen, not even the colleague with whom she watched a motorcade. Well then. In Walter's defense, two other witnesses recalled seeing a man with light or light brown hair on the fifth or sixth floor. Except they never saw a weapon, nor an accomplice. Hmm. Disagreements regarding the floors were at least in part due to the ground floor lacking visible windows. How do you know it was the sixth floor? Sixth floor rather than the fifth floor? I went with the FBI and I showed them the window, and I didn't count the bottom floor. You mean, the first time you gave a statement, you didn't count the bottom floor? Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh god. Another source of Pretty obvious was first the floor. distinct visual difference between the seventh floor and the ones below. True. When you first glance at the building, you're thrown off a little as to the floors because there's a ridge. It almost looks like a structure added onto the top of the building, about one Fair. story above. So you have to recount. Not only that, True. But multiple witnesses describe the sixth floor as the second floor from the top. But in the chaos that ensued, it seems the tail end of that sentence was not always recorded. Oh. Amos Ewens oh dear. is another curious witness because the second even though he never saw the gunman's face, he did see the top of his head. Somehow. What did you see in the building? What? I saw a ball spot on this man's head. What? Trying to look out the window. He had a ball spot on his head. I was looking at the ball spot. Oswald did not oh. have a ball spot. Okay. He was thinning a bit in the front, but otherwise had a full head of hair. 
but the strength of Ewan's account is somewhat diminished by his inability to recall much of anything else. Could you tell whether he was a black gentleman or a white man? No, sir. Couldn't even tell that, but you have described that he had yeah. a spot in his head. Yes, sir. I could see the ball spot in his head. What? Now, could you tell what color hair he had? No, sir. What? Could you tell whether his hair was dark or light? No, sir. Okay. That's suspicious or just exaggerated beyond belief. How the hell can you tell that there's a bald spot or a weird spot on somebody's head and not be able to tell the general color? Even you should, if you're looking at somebody's head, you should be able to at least differentiate dark and light. So you could differentiate a bald spot or a weird spot on somebody's head, but you couldn't generally differentiate the hair color and you couldn't even differentiate the skin color, which is bound to be a much more prominent difference. For the most part. Oh my word in heaven, there are so many conflicting stories. And so many idiots. Oh my god. Like first you got the guys who are exaggerating things, and then you got the people who, well, I suppose kind of understandably thought that, you know, guy in the, repos the, the depository was secret service of some kind, which I suppose... Now, in the eyes of a citizen, I suppose that for that time period that could make sense why people would misassume that, but as a very logical individual, that does not make a lot of sense. The, oh my god. If you have secret service, they're most likely going to be traveling with you, or they're going to be securing locations along the route. Oh boy. Could you tell whether his hair was dark or light? No, sir. Long after the assassination, 15 years to be precise, a journalist working for the Dallas Morning News tracked on a man named Johnny Powell. Powell had supposedly seen two men fiddling with a scope and a rifle in the sniper's nest. Hmm. He described their complexion as darker than white, but uh, that was about it. Once again, one has to wonder if he confused the gunmen with Jarman, Williams and Norman on the floor below. I mean, Very after possible. 15 years of silence, there's no telling how Powell's memory could have been distorted. Seriously. A good example 15 of such years. distortion is Richard Carr. A few minutes before the shooting, Carr had been standing roughly here when he spotted a man on the seventh floor of the book depository, all the way over here. What? The man was white and wore a hat, glasses, and sport coat. Wow. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Carr returned to ground level and caught sight of what he believed to be the same man now trotting south on Houston. He made a left turn right about here before being picked up by a station wagon. By 1969, however, Carr's story had that far away. changed. No the shot. The sport coat had now been standing on the fifth floor, not the seventh. After the shooting, Mr. Sport Coat had emerged from behind the book de story, accompanied by two other men. The two had been picked up by a separate station wagon before speeding away. How in the hell it's would he have seen unclear that? unclear how Carr is supposed to have seen all of this, considering what he told the FBI back in 64. Carr advised that from his location on the steel structure of the new courthouse building, it would have been impossible for him to observe the lower floors and entrance of the book depository. Right. That from his position, he could only see the top floor and the roof. In Carr's defense, oh, Lord. James Worrell had seen a man emerge from the rear entrance of the book depository about three minutes after the shooting. This man also wore a sport coat and headed south on Houston. Huh. Except the man seen by Carr was kind of stocky and wore a hat, while the man seen by Worrell had a slender build and was hatless. Besides, anyone connected with the shooting, leaving via the rear entrance, would surely have headed north not towards the scene of the crime. Right. As if that was not enough, two other witnesses, James Romack and George Rackley, stood roughly here for several minutes after the shooting. Both of them paid special attention to the rear entrance of the building. Mr. Romack stated that from the time he heard the shots, he had looked toward the book depository and had, under his immediate observation, the loading dock and the back door. He stated he is positive that no one came out of this door or out of the loading dock doors. Right, which does kind of make Could sense. Did you see the back door of the Texas School Book Depository? Yes. Were you looking towards that direction? Yes, sir. About how long did you keep your eyes fixed over there? Oh, I would say five minutes anyhow. Probably ten. I was looking up that way at all times. Did you see any people leave the Texas School Book Depository by way of the rear exit? No, sir. 
Did you see any people running north on Houston Street? No, sir. So, even if... So, here's the thing, is you have two nearly identical stories that are conflicting with a story of another potential witness and still slightly conflicting from a witness who was apparently 700 meters away. But here's the thing, is that the two witnesses who we just heard from, who we just heard testimony from, are nearly identical. And they corroborate with one another, but the other two don't. So, the more witnesses you have that are saying the same story, the more likely that it's true. I mean, th I feel like that's true in just about any case that you look. So, the, the 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 guy who was 700 meters away and then the next guy that they asked who thought he saw somebody running out of the rear of the depository, don't trust that testimony. The testimony of the two individuals who basically said the same thing and had two slightly different viewpoints, I trust their testimony. Because they corroborate one another. And the other two guys do not. Occam's razor. The mo the simplest explanation is probably the right one. And it, it, it's essentially two identical stories versus two others that are different from those two stories and different a little bit from each other. Simple math. Simple math and likelihood. Did you see any people running north on Houston Street? N no, sir. Unfortunately, conflicting accounts were not limited to the Book de Pont story. Among the hundreds of witnesses in the vicinity of Dealey Plaza, nothing was as disputed as the number and origin of the gunshots. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh, this, the, the, this, 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 this is, this is big. Yes, sir, they were probably 10 seconds apart. Do you know who fired the third shot? I didn't hear it. I, I don't recall a third shot. Two shots or three? I, Magic bullet or no? hit the ground, and I don't recall a third shot. Uh, I just couldn't, I'm not certain of that. I do know I heard two shots. Yeah, I heard three. I know you heard three. Well, yeah, I said to Jerry after the second shot, I said, my God, those are gunshots. Yep. Yep, the gunshots. I mean, yes, we've heard so many different contradicting stories. This, by far, is the most controversial for e even today, whether there were two or three shots fired. Ugh, frick, I, I really don't remember. I, I wish I had done a little bit more research on this in the past, but I really haven't. I think it's no question that there were definitely two shots fired. Whether a third shot was fired is where it gets controversial and even in some cases argumentative because here's the thing is that after the first shot goes out there are probably a limited number of people that would have identified that quickly as a gunshot i mean like we heard earlier in the video most people would probably have assumed that it was some kind of like firecracker going off which you know does make sense but by the time the second shot rings out is when people were probably going to start to realize well more people but the second shot is where more people are going to start to realize, no, those are gunshots that are ringing out. And theoretically, there are some individuals that might go into panic mode, and there might be so much confusion and adrenaline and other noise around them happening that they, they might not have necessarily registered a third shot. It's possible they could have heard a third shot, but they just didn't register it, and therefore they didn't remember that there was a third shot. It's also possible that two of the shots were so close together and there was so much panic and confusion going around that some people only heard two shots when there were actually three. Do I think there were three shots? It is very possible. Yes. I mean, there, because there are so many people who are saying that there are two shots, but there's so many people that were saying there were three shots. And if it was a very small percentage of people who thought they heard three shots, that would have been one thing. But if you have a significant proportion of people saying that there were three shots, it's much more likely that there were three shots. It is, it is, depending on circumstances, possible to miss a third shot. Now, I don't know how close together some of these shots were, but, but again, th these are the various scenarios that I could pull from my head with the limited information that I do know. But yeah, th this right here... The gunshots and the bullet, the trajectory of the bullets has been one of the most contested things in American history. No question. 
I'm loving this music that's used for these chapter transitions, by the way. It's cool, short. No one knows Short exactly how many spectators were in or near the plaza at the time of the assassination. Probably upwards well, of hundreds. 100 were at some point questioned by a combination of authorities, journalists, and others. Yeah. Attempts have been made to consolidate the various accounts, and it's clear from all such attempts that the majority of witnesses heard three shots. Okay. What's a bit less clear is the source of the explosions. The gunman was either placed in the vicinity of the book depository, marked here in red, or an area west of the building, marked in green, known as the Grassy Knoll. But as you can see from these pie charts, the hmm. assessment of ear witness testimony is highly susceptible to bias. Oh, it's yeah. a surprisingly subjective exercise that can lead to widely different results. Yes. Nevertheless, there were a substantial number of witnesses who pointed to the Grassy Knoll, located roughly here, and many of them were scattered throughout the plaza. To give you some examples, August Campbell was standing near the front entrance of the book depository, yet believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. Meanwhile, Marilyn Sitzman was standing on the grassy knoll, yet believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing beside Campbell was a woman named Geraldine Reed, who believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing by the curb in front of Sitzman was William Newman, who believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. I mean, based on the location of the depository, if the shots were supposedly fired from there, which is extremely likely for a number of reasons, but there can be strange echoes. And if if there's enough noise around you, and especially once, you know, some kind of panic and confusion starts to set in, if you start turning your head all over the place, your hearing can get a slight bit distorted and mistake directionality of certain kinds of sounds. So, I mean, mix that all together, I'm not necessarily surprised that there were some people who could not identify the general location from where a gunshot would have been fired from. Standing by the curb in front of Sitzman was William Newman, who believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. <laughs> one might therefore conclude that there must have been two assassins, one in the book Paul story and one on the grassy knoll. Okay, so I, I see now. Authors and even a congressional investigation have done precisely that. Now, uh, the scope of this video is not nearly exhaustive enough for me to attempt any conclusions regarding a second gunman, <laughs> but I do want to leave you with this. You okay. might have seen these unlabeled blue slices before. Yes. Well, that's how many witnesses heard gunshots coming from multiple directions. Ah. That is to say, next to no one did. All the shots came either from the east or west. I mean, even so, if, if, if we are talking about over a hundred witnesses, that's and especially since it's still a sort of common factor, that is still sig statistically interesting. Not statistically significant, though, but it is interesting that there were still a number of individuals. My, my estimates would be probably anywhere between four and seven people. Actually, no, four and six people, probably. Probably heard them from multiple directions. Which is interesting. I mean, given the fact that we're talking about, like, five people among about a hundred, give or take, on average, that's... It, it is interesting, but not statistically significant. That's, that's still a very small number of people. That is to say, next to no one did. All the shots True. came either from the east or west. Yep. Not both. Mr. Campbell believed the noise came from away from the book depository. This illusion, he explained, may have been due to the sound bouncing off the building and other objects in the vicinity. Yeah. August Campbell was Makes sense. far from alone in being deceived by the pronounced echoes of the gunshots. Where did the noises or shots sound to you like they came from? It was hard to tell because they had an echo, you know. There was actually two explosions with each one. There was the shot and then the echo from it, so it was hard to tell. That's true. There was too much reverberation. There was an echo which gave me a sound all over. In other words, that square is kind of... it had a sound all over. But yeah, the shots themselves... I didn't even think about the echo as a result of the shot. I, I thought of the echo of the shot, but the echo as a result of the shot. I completely forgot about, so that would... That would definitely explain why some people would have gotten confused, and why there are so many conflicting accounts about where it came from. <laughs> Whoops. I considered a lot of factors, except the echo of the echo. <laughs> In other words, that square is kind of... it had a sound all over. 
The sounds came either from up against the school depository building or near the mouth of the triple underpass. Mm -hmm. I had worked in this watchtower for some 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. and was there during the time they were renovating the school depository building and had noticed at that time the similarity of sounds occurring in either of those two locations. There is a reverberation which takes place from either location. This auditory wow. illusion was not a fluke. Not only did the building surrounding Dealey Plaza act as an echo chamber, but even experienced hunters can struggle to pinpoint the number and origin of gunshots by sound alone. Here's a quote True. from a book on that very topic, published a few years before the assassination. Little credence should be put in what anyone says about a shot or even the number of shots. These things coming upon a person suddenly are generally extremely inaccurately recorded in their memory. Yep. One of the authors asked one deer hunter last fall how many shots another hunter less than 100 yards away had fired. The answer was five. Actually, only two shots were fired. Employees in the book The Paul Story... This is experienced hunters who are familiar, familiar with guns, too. Fired. To give you some examples, on the first floor, Eddie Piper heard three shots that appeared to come from inside the building. On the third floor, Edna Case and Sandra Ellison heard nothing. Meanwhile, Stephen Wilson on the same floor heard three shots came from the west. Huh. On the fourth floor, Elsie Dorman, multiple shots came from this building across the street. <laughs> Victoria Adams, three shots from the west. Mary Hollis, three shots inside the building. But some employees not only heard the shots, but could literally feel the explosions shake the building. Wow. Could you tell where the shots were coming from? Yes, sir. They came from inside the building. How do you know that? Because the building vibrated from the result of the explosion coming in. Did you know they were shots at the time? Yes, sir. They sounded almost like cannon shots. They were so terrific. Much like Geneva Hine on the second floor, Bonnie Williams could feel the explosions up on the fifth. It sounded to Williams as though the shots had been fired from the floor above. His colleague, James Jarman, initially thought the shots had come from somewhere below, but then changed his mind and agreed with Williams. Harold Norman, meanwhile, heard far more than gunshots. Just after the president passed by, I heard a shot. And several seconds later, I heard two more shots. I knew that the shots had come from directly above me and I could hear the expended cartridges fall to the floor. Oh, wow. I could also hear the bolt action of the rifle. I mean, Next. if they were directly below where the shots were fired, that would absolutely make sense. Being able to hear the cartridges as they were essentially falling on the floor directly beneath him, that is entirely plausible. But yeah, e even hunters who were experienced with guns, gunshots, rifles, firearms in general, that sort of thing, even they can underestimate or overestimate what's actually going on. And now we're talking about a crowd of people all over the, oh, not, not, not even just like people right here, but people like here, like j just all over the freaking place. People who have so little experience with firearms for the most part. And it, did, did Oswald know that there was going to be confusion about all these shots? D did he know that was he smart enough to realize that there was reverberation and sort of echoes in the area due to the positioning of the buildings and j just the general landscape? Did Oswald know? It, it's an interesting question to consider. So there do seem to be more testimonies that point to the idea that there was a shot and then a pause, and then two more shots that were probably in close proximity to one another, time-wise speaking. So, yeah, one of my one of my initial theories about the shots was that there was one, and then there were two more that were shot close together. Because if there were three shots, only two actually hit the president, or at least somebody in that vicinity. One shot didn't, which does kind of lead me to believe that. The two shots that were fired probably in quick succession after the first one, those were the ones that hit the president. As for the first one, I, I feel like it could have hit or grazed somebody, but I don't think that first one hit the president. Again, I, I'm not remembering some of the information, and I, I could be a little bit wrong on that, but 
I don't know, after hearing this much information, I am almost confident that there were three shots that were fired. And only two definitively that hit the president. E even, even, even I know that only two shots, however many were fired, only two shots hit the president in different er in slightly different areas. And I could hear the expended cartridges fall to the floor. Entirely I plausible. Also hit a bolt action of the rifle. Entirely plausible. The explosions shook the building, and a piece of loose plaster or dirt was dislodged from the ledge above and struck Williams in the head. Meanwhile, okay. spectators in the streets below could see them leaning out the windows, looking up at the sixth floor. I just looked straight up yeah, ahead of me, makes sense. which would have been looking at the school book depository, and I noticed two black men in a window, straining to see directly above them. And my eyes followed right up to the window above them, and I saw the rifle, or what looked like a rifle. Corroboration. Frankly, somewhat entranced by the pandemonium outside, the three men remained on the fifth floor for several minutes. Meanwhile, the apparent assassin upstairs was now in a race against time. Yeah. Did you hear anything upstairs at all? No, sir. I didn't hear anything. Any footsteps? No, sir. Probably. The reason we didn't hear anything is because, you know, after the shots, we were running too. And that was making a louder noise. Why didn't you go up to the sixth floor? Really? I really don't know. We just never did think about it. Maybe it's because we were frightened. True. That is entirely plausible. I mean, somebody just shot the president. Or at least shot around the motorcade where the president was. With a gun, you might be began, terrified. Motorcycle policeman Marion Baker had just made a right turn from Main Street to Houston. Baker recognized the explosions as gunfire and could see a flock of pigeons fluttering above two buildings further up ahead. Baker made a split second decision and headed for the book DePaul story. It is interesting though, how did Oswald was escape? By Roy Truly. Truly directed Baker to the elevators, but neither was available. He pressed the button while shouting up the elevator shaft for someone upstairs to close the gate. No response. Instead, they began running up the stairs. Because what else could they do? As I came out to the second floor there, Mr. Truly was ahead of me. And as I come out, I was kind of scanning, you know, the, the rooms. Right. And I caught a glimpse of this man walking away from this. I happened to see him through this window in this door. I don't know how come I saw him, but I had a glimpse of him coming down there. Where was he coming from, do you know? No, sir. All I seen of him was a glimpse of him go away from me. What did you do? I hollered at him at that time and said, come here. He turned and walked right straight back to me. What did you say to him? I didn't get anything out of him. Mr. Truly had come up to my side here, and I turned to Mr. Truly and I says, Do you know this man? Does he work here? And he said, Yes. And I turned immediately and went on out up the stairs. The man whom Baker and Truly encountered in the second floor lunchroom was none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. The encounter oh. was brief, lasting no more than 30 seconds. Oswald appeared calm and failed to evoke suspicion, so Truly and Baker left them in the lunchroom and proceeded oh. up the stairs. They spent some time searching the roof, but there was no assassin to be found. Down by the main entrance, Geraldine Reed was still trying to process what had just occurred. She decided to return to her office on the second floor of the building. Here, about two minutes after the shooting, Reed became the last known person to have seen Oswald inside the book DePaul story. I kept walking and I looked up and Oswald was coming in the back door of the office. I met him by the time I passed my desk by several feet and I told him, I said, oh, the president has been shot, but maybe they didn't hit him. He mumbled something to me. I kept walking. He did too. I didn't pay any attention to what he said because I had no thoughts of him having any connection with the shooting at all because he was very calm. <laughs> Oswald is then presumed to have taken the front stairs and on his way out the main entrance encountered someone looking for a phone. There are at least two candidates for who this person might have been, but Oswald mm. seems to have pointed up the phone inside the building before blending into the chaos outside. Huh. He was next observed boarding a bus a few blocks east of now. Huh. So then that would have meant that Oswald would have shot, and as soon as he realized that his shots probably made their mark, or definitely made their mark, it's kind of hard to tell, but 
he he could he then probably would have immediately backtracked and 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 possibly left the rifle up there or hit I don't I, I don't exactly know where the rifle was at this point he definitely didn't have it by the time that the officer met him though but he could have left the rifle behind or he could have stashed it somewhere and made his way down the stairs most likely and then he try and then he probably could have heard somebody coming up the stairs which was the officer and truly and then tried to go in a different direction and that's where he was encountered that's where he encountered the uh, that actually could theoretically make sense assuming that oswald hurried out of there but because the off because nothing was said about whether oswald was out of breath or not but oswald definitely had to have come from he had to have been on the sixth floor and then immediately gone down the stairs but there, he couldn't have been out of breath because the officer didn't notice that and it didn't seem like the officer or truly really noticed that. I feel like they would have. But Oswald could have been very brisk, and then he could have slowed down a little bit. And then once he heard that somebody was coming up, he could have, or like, you know, could have opened the door to go up the stairs, or could have heard some, like, talking near the stairs. He could have immediately gone, diverted his path to the point where he was just, just barely in the vision of the officer and truly as they were heading up the stairs to the second floor. Or from the second floor to the third floor. Okay, that does that, that. That's that is plausible. That could make sense. Nearly four months after the assassination, Truly and Baker participated in a crude reconstruction of the shooting to time their movements. The mm -hmm. experiment was repeated twice. On the first attempt, it took them one minute and thirty seconds to reach the second floor lunchroom. Then okay. one minute and fifteen seconds. These time trials were primarily conducted to determine whether Oswald could have fired the shots from the sixth floor and still made it down to the second in time for his encounter with Truly and Baker. After all, if there wasn't enough time, Oswald could not have been the assassin. A right. bunch of different routes were tested, and while Oswald could theoretically have taken one of the elevators or even the fire escape, mm. in practice, there wasn't enough time. No, there wasn't. You do not think the assassin used any of the elevators at any time to get from the sixth to the second floor? No. You mean after the shooting? No, sir. He just could not, because those elevators, I saw myself, were both on the fifth floor. They were both even. The and only probably other slow. Means of descent was the stairway. A standing in for the gunman trotted down from the sixth floor to the second in one minute and 18 seconds. Then, at a slightly faster pace, in one minute and 14 seconds. Yeah, theoretically there plausible. Was just enough time. There was. It's therefore possible yeah. that Oswald stopped I thought, I thought as much. Floor, perhaps upon hearing Truly shouting up the elevator shaft, and attempted to hide in the lunchroom mere seconds ahead of Truly and Baker's arrival. That too, yeah. But That's it's not very similar to what I said. That simple, because Oswald was not the only person using the stairway to escape the building. Oh? Who? Okay, so if okay that I, I I didn't think about that that there's somebody else who was going to be in the stairway. As previously mentioned, Victoria Adams watched the motorcade from an office on the fourth floor of the Book Depot story. True. Within thirty seconds of the shooting, Adams ran down the stairs to the first floor along with her colleague Sandra Stiles. Mhm. Mm when you got to the bottom of the first floor, did you see anyone there as you entered the first floor from the stairway? Yes, sir. Who did you see? Mr. William Shelley and Billy Lovelady. Now, what did you do after you encountered Mr. Shelley and Mr. Lovelady? I said I believed the president was shot. Do you remember what they said? Nothing. Then what did you do? I proceeded out to the Houston Street Dock. There are two significant problems with Adam's account. Okay. The first being that she and Stiles supposedly left the fourth floor within 30 seconds of the shooting and then ran down the stairs to the first. This would place them in approximate sync with Oswald, descending from the sixth floor Approximate, to the but not exact. Now, as you were running down the stairs, did you encounter anyone? Not during the actual running down the stairs, no sir. Did you hear anyone using the stairs? No sir. Hmm. But okay, perhaps Oswald was a few flights above, and his footsteps were drowned out by their own. This yeah, that that's Stiles my first thought. Adams left the fourth floor mere seconds ahead of Oswald's arrival. That would make sense. Floor mere seconds ahead of Roy Truly and Marion Baker's ascent before encountering William Shelley and Billy Lovelady right about here. Theoretically plausible. But this is when problem number two makes an entrance. Okay. When the president was shot, Shelley and Lovelady stood on the front steps of the book depository. 
they spend several minutes roaming about outside before returning to the building. And that's the problem. How did Stiles and Adams encounter Shelley and Lovelady within seconds of the shooting if it took them several minutes to return to the building? Hmm, Who did that, you is, see that is an interesting issue. After returning to the book depository. I saw a girl, but I wouldn't swear to it. It's Vicky. What is her full name? I wouldn't know. Vicky Adams? I believe so. Would you say it was Vicky you saw? I couldn't swear. Where was the girl? I don't remember what place she was, but I remember seeing a girl and she was talking to Shelly or saw Shelly or something. Shelly could recall no such incident. Huh. Presuming that Lovelady was correct and Shelly had a lapse of memory, it's possible their encounter with Stiles and Adams occurred minutes About rather than seconds minutes after, the after the shooting. After yeah. all, Adams could have been mistaken. Yeah, these are those this are some scenario, weird corroborations. Made Not. His escape. Truly and Baker went upstairs, and then several minutes later, Stiles and Adams left the building. But it's not quite that simple. Oh, Watching geez. the motorcade alongside Stiles and Adams was their supervisor, Dorothy Garner. Miss Garner stated this morning that after Miss Adams went downstairs, she, Miss Garner, saw Mr. Truly and the policeman come up. Not only does this account corroborate that of Adams, meaning they left within seconds, not minutes, but it implies that Garner was in a position to observe the stairway from somewhere on the fourth floor. In huh. spite of this, Garner made no mention of seeing Oswald scampering down the stairs between Stiles and Adams' departure and Truly and Baker's arrival. Oh, these are some weird what accounts. What makes this conflict so difficult to resolve is that neither Stiles nor Garner were called to testify. We have but a few brief statements of what they witnessed. Oh. All we know about Sandra Stiles is that she went down the stairs with Adams. Did it happen within seconds of the shooting? We don't know. Did she see or hear anyone else while running down the stairs? We don't know. Did she encounter Shelley and Lovelady on the first floor? We don't know. Oh. Authorities appear to have presumed yep. Adams unreliable and then ignored the witnesses who could have easily refuted oh, or confirmed geez. that presumption. A oh, simple no. reenactment like the one granted Truly and Baker could have gone a long way to resolve this issue. Oh man. That's I granted, there there were probably hundreds of potential witnesses with all different kinds of accounts, but these are people who are inside the depository. Being able to not really not even nail down, but to get a more general idea, or at least a more actually in this case a more specified idea of the time frame of things probably could have helped res resolve some of the timeline issues that happened with these conflicting accounts oh no oh this was oh no some of these testimonies were mishandled so badly god it's oh jeez i'm getting i'm getting flashbacks to the oj case ugh i mean Granted, this is not necessarily forensically mishandled, this is more police mishandled, but just the mishandling of testimony and potential witnesses like this, oh, that hurts. That hurts me internally so much. I mean, would they have been able to deduce that it was Oswald a lot faster that way? I don't know, but they could have resolved the timeline and the accounts a bit better if they had... If, if, they, if they hadn't mishandled some of these testimonies, if, if they had tried to corroborate as much as they possibly could. Oof. Especially, especially right away, especially within like 24 hours after it happened. What they should have done is they should have barred, they should have barred all of the entrances. They should have prevented everybody from leaving or entering until they had all the statements that they could possibly get right then and there. Now granted, at the time, there were a lot of people who didn't really know where the shots had come from. I mean, there were a lot of people inside the building who were like, yeah, I'm pretty sure the shots came from within the building, but those people were inside the building. I'm talking about all the people on the street in the motorcade who had no idea necessarily what was going on, who could only guess. <sighs> oh man, that one. Jeez, though, that, that, that hurts. That hurts so much. A simple reenactment like the one granted Truly and Baker could have gone a long way to resolve this issue. Oh, absolutely. But that never happened. No. No, Many it did not. after the assassination, author Barry Ernest was able to track down Sandra Stiles, Dorothy Garner, and Victoria Adams. 
Styles confirmed that she and Adams left the window within seconds of the shooting, but she doesn't explicitly say they left the fourth floor within seconds. In any case, as they moved quickly down the stairs, she heard no footfall apart from their own. Garner confirmed she never witnessed the descent of Oswald, despite seeing Trulian Baker heading upstairs. Adams went a bit further and accused investigators of tampering with their testimony. I'm beginning oh. to wonder if the Shelley and Lovelady encounter was inserted into my testimony later. I remember saying to a fairly big black man inside the building, right near the loading dock, right after I got down the stairs, that I thought the president may have been shot. Sandra Stiles apparently hmm. told Ernest something similar. A few people were milling around on the first floor. One was a black man. Shelly and Lovelady were definitely not on the first floor when we got there. The only black employees who could have possibly made it to the rear stairway in time were Carl Jones, Roy Lewis, Eddie Piper, and Troy West. Okay, so this is basically either going off the assumption and or confirmation that they did go down that that big stairwell. Because on the fourth floor, if I'm remembering this correctly, and I'm pretty sure I actually am, is that there was actually a stairwell much close, a passenger, no, no, that was a passenger elevator. I could have sworn that there was another stairwell, though. Shoot, I'm, wait, okay, no, 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 there was, there was, oh no, okay, oh, never mind, never mind. There was a freight elevator that went up to all floors, and then a stairwell that was close to that that went up to all floors, and almost on the opposite side of the building, there was a passenger elevator that went up to the first four floors, and then a small stairwell that went between the first and second floor. Okay, so never mind. Okay, I, I, I was having a problem until I remember that there were two different elevators, not two different stairwells. Got it. Okay, I'm with it. The only black employees who could have possibly made it to the, the rear ones stairway on the fifth floor were Carl Jones, Roy Lewis, Eddie Piper, and Troy West. Oh, oh, no, 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 never mind. Approximate positions at the time of the shooting, but during the seconds and minutes that followed, only Piper is known to have paid any attention to the stairs in the back. As soon as the shooting began, Piper okay. crossed the first floor to get a better view of a clock. He remained in roughly this location until he observed Trulian Baker running up the stairs. Okay, that lines up. Had anybody come down the steps before Trulian Baker went up the steps? No, sir. Did Vicky Adams come down before Truly and Baker went up the steps? No, sir. No, sir. She didn't do it. Remember James hmm. Romack and George Rackley? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't blame you if you don't. There's like a hundred different names. No, I like remember them. these guys. They were the ones who failed to spot anyone leaving the book depository via the rear entrance for several minutes after the shooting. Yep. Well, the thing is, according to both Styles and Adams, they left the book depository via the rear entrance upon reaching the first floor. So if Romack and Rackley are to be believed, then once again, the descent of Styles and Adams must have taken place minutes rather than seconds after the shooting. That would make sense. Not only that, but when Sandra Styles was contacted by another researcher, she apparently expressed great uncertainty regarding the stairwell descent and thought it might in fact have occurred a couple of minutes after the shooting. Well, yeah, if it was decades later, it'd be hard to remember that, but that would make more sense if it was minutes after, not the seconds. The conspiracy crowd will, of course, amplify the more suspicious elements, while those who support the official narrative will focus on that which discredits Adams. Right. But ultimately, we don't know the exact timeline of events. No. It's difficult enough to pin down the minute-by-minute -minute chronology. Oh, Once yeah. get down to seconds, there's a lot of guesswork at play. Oh, there's the so much guesswork. It gives us a rough estimate, but that's not cast in stone. They could have easily been a bit faster, a bit slower. So too could have Shelley, Lovelady, Garner, Stiles, Adams, and Oswald. Would you say that the reconstruction that we did on March the 20th was a minimum or a maximum time? Oh, I would say that would be the minimum. Time. That's what I was thought too. Cause yeah, that 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 that's that's immediately what I was thought when they were doing the the reenactment. Uh, truly and the officer whose name I, can, I don't know why I remember Truly's name but not the officer's name but Truly and the officer were able to do some runs in like what was it a minute 30 and a minute 18 but that's them going immediately and probably briskly going through the um through the first floor and up to the second floor but that doesn't account for some for some of the uncertainty like the officer could have, the officer could have had a short exchanged a couple of words with that with an individual, including truly, 
and there could the officer could have been looking around and there there probably might have been a slower pace between the two of them as they tried to figure out what was going on so yeah I, I it was something that was on my mind earlier but i like the fact that it's getting called out now that that minute 18 and that minute 30 could very well have been a minimum time there's no way that was a maximum time. No way in heck. There, there are so many other factors that, that are not being mentioned. And and this is assuming that truly and the officer just went straight through the first floor as, as simply or as briskly as they could. Doesn't matter. Either applies. But it, it doesn't account for the other variables of them actually going slower. So, minimum time? Oh yeah. No, definitely. Oh, I would say that would be the minimum. Minimum. Oh yeah, we I would did agree. Everything that I did that day, and this would be the minimum time because I'm sure that I, you know, it took me a little longer. Even Baker agrees with that. that. We don't know much about the Baker. layout of the fourth floor beyond this crude schematic. If the other floors are any indication, much of this space was occupied by bookshelves and tall stacks of boxes. This is significant because Dorothy Garner never actually saw Styles and Adams enter the stairway. She only heard footsteps of what she presumed to be them running oh. up the stairs. So then she might have actually heard Oswald going down the stairs. That would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. All right, here we go. Are we going to get more information on the casings? Following a quick sweep of the roof, Roy Truly and Marion Baker returned to the ground floor of the Book to Paul story. What did you do when you got back to the first floor, or what did you see? When I got back to the first floor, at first I didn't see anything except officers running around, reporters in the place. Yep. There was a regular madhouse. Had they sealed off the building yet, do you know? I am sure they had. Then what? Then, in a few minutes, it could have been moments or minutes at a time like that, I noticed some of my boys were over in the west corner of the shipping department and there were several officers over there taking their names and addresses, and so forth. I noticed that Lee Oswald was not among these boys. The building Oswald wasn't sealed was fast the enough. Absentee, but he was the only one whom truly knew for a fact had left the building after the shooting. True. Meanwhile, on the sixth floor, a stack of boxes in the southeast corner attracted the attention of Deputy Luke Mooney. Mm, I went straight we across to the southeast corner of the building, and I saw all these high boxes. And the minute I squeezed between these two stacks of boxes, I had to turn myself sideways to get in there. Yep. That is when mm. I saw the expended shells, and the boxes that were stacked up looked to be a rest for the weapon. Two windows west of the sniper's nest, authorities found a bottle of Dr. Pepper and some chicken bones, leftovers from the lunch eaten by Bonnie Williams shortly before oh. the assassination. Okay, got it. But according to some officers, including Mooney, remains of a similar meal were also found in the sniper's nest. Hmm. Does this photograph show any place where you saw the chicken bone? If I recall correctly, the chicken bone could have been laying on this box, or it might have been laying on this box right here. Hmm. There was one of them partially eaten, and there was a little small paper poke. By poke, you mean a paper sack? Right. The assassin could just maybe take one step and lay it over there if he was the one that put it there. In okay, this, interesting. No such items were ever photographed. Apart from the sack of chicken ah, found here, there are no that hurts. of leftovers being recovered from anywhere else near the sniper's nest. Now, did you see a chicken bone over near the boxes in the southeast corner? I don't believe there was one there. You didn't see any. Hmm. One witness, a deputy sheriff named Luke Mooney, said he found a piece of chicken partly eaten on top of one of the boxes. Did you see anything like that? No. Was, Was it moved? Like that called to your attention? I can't recall anything like that. He also but may not have been looking. The chicken bones. There were similar disagreements regarding the three cartridge cases. Okay. According to Mooney, Dallas Police Captain William Fritz tampered with the evidence. Are those the empty shells you found? Yes, sir. Now, will you take this marker and encircle the shells? All right. They were turned over to Captain Fritz? Yes, sir. He was the first officer that picked them up, as far as I know. Because I stood there and watched him go over and pick them up and look at them. Is this the position of the cartridges, as shown in this photograph, as you saw them? Yes, sir. That is just about the way they were laying, to the best of my knowledge. I do know there was one further away and these other two were relatively close to each other 
on this particular area. Hmm. But these cartridges, this one and this one, looks like they are further apart than they actually was. Now, I didn't quite understand. Did okay. you say that it was your memory that A and B were not that close together? Just from my memory, it seems that this cartridge ought to have been over this way a little further. Hmm. You mean the B cartridge should be closer to the C? Closer to the C, yes, sir. Mooney did huh. not explicitly state, but strongly implied that Captain Fritz moved at least one of the cartridge cases before they were photographed. According Interesting. Fritz, he did everything by the book. And yet, in a weird way, it would actually make sense. Because, yeah, witness testimony and memory, you might misremember or exaggerate some things. That is a common factor among varieties of witness testimony. But... If there was one shot fired, and then there were two more that were fired in qui in relatively quick succession, it would actually make a little bit more sense if the C card if the A, B, and C cartridges were actually found in the place that they were photographed, as is seen in in this image. Because, you know, you, you you have the C cartridge, which is much further away, which was. The one shot before the pause, and then the two that were po very possibly in quick succession, which would make sense with A and B being so close together. Now, theoretically, there could have been a little bit of an evidence temp tampering. That is, that is honestly entirely possible. It wouldn't make too much sense for that to be the case, though. Unless either the individual was inexperienced or in on the conspiracy. The latter of which is much more unlikely, personally. But... It is possible. And of course it is possible that Mooney is misremembering some of this information and the places where the cartridges were found were actually where they were found and Mooney just mis misremembered some of the minute details. Mooney did not explicitly state, but strongly implied that Captain Fritz moved at least one of the cartridge cases before they were photographed. Was Mooney intentionally According suggesting Fritz, that though? He did everything by the book. I told them not to move the cartridges, not to touch anything till we could get the crime lab to take pictures of them, just as they were lying there. And I left an officer assigned there to see that that was done. And the crime lab came almost immediately and took pictures and dusted the shelves for prints. Amidst the swarm of officers canvassing the sixth floor was a lone journalist by the name of Thomas Ollier. Ollier hmm. was equipped with a camera and actually filmed much of the frantic search effort. Oh. About three wow. decades later, Ollier made some rather startling claims that were largely consistent with, but also expanded upon those made by Mooney. After filming hmm. the casings, I asked Captain Fritz, who was standing at my side, if I could go behind the barricade and get a close-up shot of the casings. He told me that it would be better if I got my shots from outside the barricade. He then rounded the pile of boxes and entered the enclosure. This was the first time anybody walked between the barricade and the windows. Fritz then walked to the casings, picked them up, and held them in his hand over the top of the boxes for me to get a close-up shot of the evidence. I filmed about eight seconds of a close-up shot of the shell casings in Captain Fritz's hand. While these alleged portions of Ollie's film have never surfaced, preservation took a back seat while the film was being prepared for broadcast. Mm. Portions of the film were carelessly chopped up and discarded, and fragmentary clips are oh. all that remains today. Oh, geez. In any case, after supposedly filming the casings in the hand of Captain Fritz, Ollie recalled how they were deceitfully returned to the floor. Over 30 minutes later, Captain Fritz reached into his pocket and handed the casings to Detective Robert Studebaker. Studebaker never saw the original placement of the casings, so he tossed them on the floor and photographed them. Oh no. Oh god, that hurts. That hurts so freaking much. Unbelievable. So, wait a minute. If Okay, here's the thing. Studebaker. So, this would have been Detective Studebaker, who was probably one of the forensic team members and one of the evidence collectors. So there is an implication here with possible video evidence to boot might, that might not actually exist anymore, if at all. But it is possible that Fritz picked up the evidence and allowed Allie, Al, Al, Allie? I think that was how his name is pronounced, allowed this photographer to get images of the evidence before they were, pla they, they were just placed or tossed back on the floor before photographs were taken, before prints were taken, 
if if I'm understanding that correctly, if this stud baker, the detective, is the one who actually took the photographs and tried to get prints off the evidence, and if this account is true, that is such a blatant mishandling of evidence on so many levels. That is infuriating. I mean, I know this is the 60s. This is like the mid-60s. But that, oh, that is so infuriating. If that's true. If Studbaker was the one who took the pictures that we saw earlier and collected the evidence and dusted it for prints. And if Fritz was the one who allowed a picture or video to be taken of them before they were placed back, placed or tossed back to where they might have been originally found. Oh my word in heaven. You guys have no idea how much that pisses me off. Holy shit. If, if I were a CSI or detective, if that happened in today's day and age, oh, I'd be filing a report in an instant. I would be furious. Oh. Jesus. Hey, cool. Oh. Hmm. My sister just handed me a piece of, uh, of this, uh, really good zucchini. Definitely cooked for a little bit. I don't usually eat zucchini by itself very much, but I don't know. That was, uh, that was, that was, that was seasoned and cooked very nicely. Very nicely, yes. Studebaker never saw the original placement of the casings, so he tossed them on the floor and photographed them. To counterbalance these allegations of foul play, I must also mention that there were those who found nothing amiss about the cartridge cases. Did you see a picture taken of the holes? Yes, sir. When the picture was taken, were the holes in the same position as when you had first seen them? Yes, sir. They were. Even Mooney sort of agreed that the casings had not been moved, immediately after explaining that they had been moved. In the testimony we heard a few minutes ago, Mooney was shown this photograph. He then examined this one, taken from a different angle, before being shown this one. Now, these two are just differently cropped copies of the same photograph. They are, yeah. I have another picture. Here is a picture taken, also from another angle. Does that show the cartridges? Yes, sir. Now, compare that with the other photograph. Yes, sir. Is that about the way it looked? Yes, sir. That is right. It sure is. Again, I did say if that was true. I didn't I didn't specifically agree with the fact that that's what happened. I said if it's true, that part about the casings would have infuriated me. If it was true, if not I, I, I said it as an if statement. My statement still stands, though. If anything like that were true, and I was the detective or the CSI assigned to that, I would be royally pissed off. That's evidence contamination. That's evidence mishandling and tampering. <sighs> I did say if. I never confirmed that I believed that's what happened. I said if that were true. Okay. Okay. But, if Mooney was seeing it from multiple angles and just got a little bit confused on the placement of said angles, that would make sense as to why he got confused initially, but then essentially retracted later on. That fits, though. The, the, this, the, the, this position of these casings does make sense in my head, based on what I believe happened with the shots. With one shot, pause, two shots two shots in somewhat quick succession are we on the same page do we understand <laughs> good <laughs> let's keep going <laughs> is that about the way it looked yes sir that is right it sure is that doesn't really gel with the casing supposedly being picked up and haphazardly tossed back on the floor right as thomas allier would claim decades later <laughs> Yep. While there are question marks surrounding the chicken bones in the cartridge cases, there can be no doubt that some of the boxes in the sniper's nest were moved prior to being photographed. Do you have any pictures of the boxes near the window before they were moved, other than those you have showed me? Just these two. 
Then you don't have any pictures taken of the boxes before they were moved? No. Now, I will show you another picture. Was that taken by you? Yes. Does that show the position of the boxes before or after they were moved? That's after they were dusted. There's fingerprint dust on every box. Yes, so there is. And they were not in that position then when you first saw them. No. Several okay. After I don't like that either. Was discovered a bolt action rifle was found between two rows of boxes near the stairway. Mm, okay. Now there was some initial confusion regarding its make and model. Some thought it looked like a mouser, but upon closer inspection, it was identified as an Italian Carcano. The officer hmm. who misidentified the rifle later explained that he did so at a glance. Yeah. However, over a decade after the assassination in 1976, a former yeah. deputy sheriff by the name of Roger Craig claimed to have seen the marking 7.65 Mauser stamped right on the barrel of the rifle. To some, this is evidence that a Mauser was in fact discovered on the sixth floor before being swapped for a Carcano. Hmm. But Craig was the only person to make this specific claim, yeah. did so many years after the assassination and after telling a journalist the following. Did you handle that rifle on the sixth floor? Yes, I did. I couldn't give its name because I don't know foreign rifles. I know it was foreign made and you loaded it downward into a built in clip. But was there a was another foreign? rifle, a Mauser, found up on the roof of the depository that afternoon. There were no reports of a Mauser being found on the roof either. Yeah, I mean, that's. That, yeah, if, if, if of maybe dozens of people. One person, one and singular person, is talking about this mouser on on the roof, but nobody else can corroborate. I'm sorry, Occam's razor. It is highly unlikely that that actually took place. But it seems like such a weird deviation. I mean, he's he is essentially the only one who saw a second gun in the depository at all, which is a weird deviation. In the grand scheme of things so i'm wondering how that very potentially falsified memory is coming to him and not to mention this is decades later as well there there must be some misconception or mistake there there has to be that's the only explanation because again he was the one person out of likely dozens who investigated the case to have seen a second gun in the depository regarding rifles and the shooting it doesn't make sense otherwise. There were no reports of a mouser being found on the roof either. Besides, the only rifle seen in the film taken by Thomas Ollier is unmistakably a Carcano. Oh yeah, definitely. The unique markings on the cartridge cases would later prove that this was indeed the rifle from which all three had been fired. Are they dusting the that without over, gloves? The rifle had been traced to a company in Chicago, Illinois. The company had sold the rifle to someone named A. Hiddell and shipped it to a post office box in Dallas in early 1963. Wow, they were able to get that much information in the 60s? Okay, that's actually a little bit impressive. I'm a little bit surprised they were able to get that much information. No, hold up, back up. The rifle from which Is he dusting a rifle for prints without gloves? Hold Okay, because you can see his right hand... You can see the right hand dusting, but hold up. Look and see how the gun moves, and look for a potential left hand. Cases would like to prove that this was indeed the rifle. Do you see? Did you see? Did you see it? Did you see the gun being twisted a little bit? You can't really see the guy's left hand, but based on his positioning, it is almost certain that he is holding the gun with his left hand and dusting it with fingerprints with his right. But it doesn't look like he's wearing gloves on that right hand. Now again, you can't see his left hand. But there is a very real chance that he, if he doesn't have a glove on his right hand, he also doesn't have one on his left. He is contaminating evidence with his own prints. That is infuriating. That is... That's concerning and infuriating all at the same time. I mean, there, even if, even if he still dusted, there, there could be one possibility that he dusted that gun for prints already. And he already took the prints from that part of the gun that he's currently holding. But that could still mean that he was holding the gun elsewhere. And still potentially putting his prints on another part of the gun. Holy crap. Oh, I'm mad. I'm, I am, I am so mad. Okay. This 
is a much more blatant issue than that potential casings tampering earlier. I'm pretty confident that the scenario beforehand where Fritz could have potentially tampered with the location of the casings, I'm fairly confident, I'd say over 80% confident, that that did not occur. That tampering, intentional or otherwise, did not occur. I mean, there may have been a little bit, but not that severe. This is an entirely different issue. This is a potentially serious offense. Ooh, 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 ooh. And this is this is videographical evidence too, meaning this is solely undisputed. And you can tell, you can absolutely tell he doesn't have a glove on his right hand because you can see the hairs on his right hand as as he's dusting. Oh my god. I am so mad right now. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it, but I'm so mad right now. The rifle had been traced to a company in Chicago, Illinois. The company had sold the rifle to someone named A. Hiddell and shipped it to a post office box in Dallas in early 1963. Okay. Alec James Hiddell was a pseudonym known to have been used by Oswald. Ah. So there was now a direct link between the shells, the rifle, and Oswald. Not only that, but Oswald's prints were lifted from both the rifle and boxes in the sniper's nest. Yeah, except based on what I was just saying too about potentially somebody adding their prints on is that oh gosh, there's so many fingerprint issues i'm still mad and look at these images too okay so oswald's fingerprint that is a clear print that is a very obvious print that's a whirl that's a really cool whirl you see you see how how kind of how some of it some of the markings kind of kind of branch out and bifurcate the way that they do on in the in the bottom left corner I don't know why, but that's kind of cool. I don't have any whirls on my fingerprints. I'm I have primarily um, loops and then a couple of arches as well. Um, I even have a double loop on one of my fingers. It, it's literally like two loops that wrap around each other. It's actually kind of cool. But that fingerprint on the box. Oh jeez, that's such a. That's okay. That's either a really bad print or that's a really bad image of a print. I know the cameras were not nearly as effective and as clear as they are today, but that is a really bad image of the print. I mean, here's the thing though: you can see some first-level detail that does match up. In other, and, and, and in this case, first-level detail would essentially be the general shape and type of fingerprint. I mean, you do see some of these slight bifurcations kind of like what appears in oswald's finger and you can see that it definitely looks like a whirl possibly a loop but it it is a little bit tricky to determine but it could definitely fit the general configuration of oswald's fingerprint but then you get into the second level detail and then it becomes harder it becomes hard in this particular image to tell because the first thing you always want to look for is the type and general flow of the fingerprint. That's the, that's always the first thing you want to look for when you're comparing a known fingerprint with an unknown print, or even two unknowns. But once you start comparing second level detail, these are the specific markings in fingerprints. See, these are the bifurcations, the islands, these are the, the ridge endings, these are the forks, the bridges, like, like specific markings. Within fingerprints, you look for these. You compare the two prints next to each other, and you look for as many potential similarities as you can. Now, granted, this is just an image, so you can't necessarily see it too well, but a fingerprint analyst back in those days, and I'm pretty sure there were, even if there weren't fingerprint analysts specifically back in those days, there were still CSIs who were trained in fingerprint analysis. That is no doubt. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But some but the analyst would have a much better job of analyzing this print and comparing it to any other known prints so again it could just be really bad quality of the image but some of these some of the second level detail is really difficult to see in this particular poor quality image if you're just looking at the type of pattern you could make a reasonable assumption that it looks a lot like oswald's fingerprint 
And granted, this is these are these are only two of the fingerprints as well that are being compared to one another. This th th there could have been so many others, but I mean, if the qual if that's what that fingerprint looked like, that is such poor quality. You could maybe get a partial print at best, and I'm pretty sure that at least back in the '60s. The only way you could find fingerprints was with, like, the dusty fingerprint powder. Really messy stuff. You can easily, if you're not trained, you can easily put too much fingerprint powder on your brush or a surface, and you could potentially get a partial print instead of a full print, or you could ruin the print altogether. Yeah, partial print, print lifted from rifle? You can barely see that in this poor quality image. <laughs> oh, man. Is it clear that I know a lot about fingerprints? I think it. I, th I think it would be clear. I know a lot about fingerprints. I know what I'm talking about. When we were doing mock crime scenes in one of my classes, as in we spent weeks processing a mock crime scene. <gasps> you don't need to ensure one of us will, or you can put it back. Okay. Thank you. My sister has to me food. <laughs> but yeah, when we were processing mock crime scenes for weeks. In one of my college classes, one of my one of my last college classes at that, is we we all kind of worked on on we took we took turns and processed the crime scene together, but eventually we all had our own assignments for lab related activities, and I was the designated fingerprint analyst. I even had to put together a presentation on the prints that I had gathered from specific objects and compared them with one another. I had to put that all in a presentation and present it at a mock trial with law students. One of the coolest and most nerve-wracking things I've ever done. <laughs> that was no, it, it, it was it was really cool, but man, those law students are something else. But yes, I I was the designated fingerprint analyst of my team, so I kind of know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Apart from the spent shells and the rifle, authorities discovered one other key piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything else up in the southeast corner of the sixth floor? Yes, sir. We found this brown paper sack, or case. It was made out of heavy wrapping paper. Actually, it looked similar to the paper that those books in the building was wrapped in. It was just a long, narrow paper bag. Similar to what he had brought in initially? Here, yet this space is suspiciously empty in all the crime scene photographs. Huh. How long was Why the paper bag, approximately? I don't know. I picked it up and dusted it for prints. And they took it down there and sent it to Washington. And that's the last I'd seen of it. Bef and I don't know. Did you take a picture of it before you picked it up? No. Does that sack show in any of the pictures you took? No, it, it doesn't show in any of the pictures. That's another serious offense, too. And this one is a little bit more obvious, too. I mean, oh, no. So, you mean to tell me... That you saw something strange and suspicious. You even tested it for prints. But you, A, were possibly not even wearing gloves. Meaning you could have contaminated that evidence with your own prints. And B, you took no pictures of it before you even touched it. That is a huge no-no. Huge no-no. You No, 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 no. Absolutely not. You want to photograph everything before you touch it at all. Gloves or no gloves. I mean, obviously, you should absolutely be wearing gloves, goggles, bunny suit, whatever you possibly can when you're processing evidence at a crime scene. But before you touch or process any evidence whatsoever, have your placards at the ready, have your camera at the ready, and take photographs of everything. And I mean everything. And and you want multiple photographs from multiple views. You want the overall views, you want the mid-range views, you especially want the close-up views of all the evidence and their associated placards. And their, then you can corroborate it later. You can create an actual good map of a crime scene based on photographs. And I mean, oh my god. I absolutely hate how much of this investigation was botched. Not all of it was. But when it came to grabbing witness testimony, this strange paper bag that likely is what had the rifle that Oswald 
brought with him when he carpooled with his neighbor that same morning. I don't know for sure, but it is very likely that's what it was. But failure to grab all the witness testimony, the issue with the casings, the issue with obtaining prints from the rifle in the first place, and this strange long paper bag of sorts. Holy crap, these are so many errors. Oh, that bother that bo that bothers me to no end. Does that sack show in any of the pictures you took? No, it, it doesn't show in any of the pictures. Detective Robert Studebaker, who'd been working as a forensic assistant for less than two months, neglected to explain why he never photographed the bag. In Studebaker's defense, no one was on the lookout for a brown paper bag. Assassin, sure, rifle, casings, absolutely, but some debris in a dark-lit corner of the room? It wasn't until the bag was picked up and inspected that its significance became apparent. Do you remember anything about what the sack looked like? Well, it was assumed at the time that it was the sack that the rifle was wrapped up in when it was brought into the building, and yep. it appeared that it could have been used for that. Oh, yeah. Now, as you may recall, Wesley Fraser drove Oswald back to Irving on November the 21st to pick up some curtain rods. The following morning, Oswald was seen carrying a package by both Fraser and his sister, Lenny Randall. Yep. According to Fraser, Oswald told him the package contained curtain rods, which he then brought back to Dallas. But you may also recall that Jack Doherty denied seeing such a package. Did you see Oswald come to work that morning? Yes, when he first came into the door. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? Well, not that I could see of. Like I said earlier, not that he could see of. That doesn't mean that 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 that's that's not him saying no. He didn't have anything in his hands. Cause he, here's the thing: is that Doherty, Doherty, uh, I'm just gonna go with Doherty. Doherty could have had a relatively clear visual of Oswald when he first came in. But there could have been parts of him, like maybe one of his arms, or maybe Oswald was turned in a way that he couldn't see Oswald carrying anything from the view that he had, from the perspective that he had. Dougherty is not saying that Oswald didn't have anything in his hands or arms. Dougherty couldn't tell if he could see any, if he could see anything in Oswald's hands, hands or arms. Th this, th this is not a definitive answer. This is conjecture at best. Because Dougherty is not specifically stating that Oswald did not have anything in his hands or arms. He is not explicitly saying that. He's essentially saying he didn't think he saw anything. But we don't know the exact perspective or view he had. That's not being specified here. Either because the police did not ask the right questions, or Dougherty was not being clear enough. But, depending on the layout, depending on his perspective, Oswald could have been holding something, and Dougherty would not have been in the right perspective to see it. The right questions are not being asked here. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? Well, not that I could see of. The thing is, Dougherty was not a reliable witness. When questioned mm. by the FBI and Secret nope. Service, he appeared very confused about times and places. He required assistance from his father due to considerable difficulty in coordinating his mental faculties with his speech. <laughs> While Doherty denied having such issues, his testimony is nonetheless riddled with contradictions. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, did you go to lunch? Well, I went back downstairs to eat lunch, yes sir. What time? Oh, it was 12 o'clock. Wait a minute, did you hear the shots before or after your lunch? Before. Before I ate my lunch. You heard shots before you ate your lunch. Oh, good I lord. See. Yes, I believe I did. Now, did you hear a shot either before or after lunch? It was before lunch. It, it was before lunch. You think it was before lunch you oh, heard the shot? Oh boy. I believe it was. Yes, sir. <laughs> While Doherty insisted that Oswald had nothing in his hands when he arrived at work, it turned out that this certitude was based on nothing but a glance. Now, is that a very definite impression that you saw Oswald that morning when he came to work? Well, oh, it's like this. I'll try to explain it to you this way. You see, I was sitting on the wrapping table, and when he came in the door, I just caught him out of the corner of my eye. 
Oh, good lord. Given that Fraser had eyes on Oswald for several minutes, the weight of evidence suggests he carried a package to work on the morning of November the 22nd. Yeah. A far more contentious that, question that makes sense. is whether the package carried by Oswald was the same as the brown paper bag discovered on the sixth floor. It's According very impossible. Randall and Frazier, the only two witnesses known to have seen the package, the answer was a definite no. Really? Now, was the length of the package any similar to the bag? Anywhere near similar? Well, it wasn't that long. I mean, it was folded down at the top, as I told you. It definitely wasn't that long. I told the FBI That's vague. that as far as the length of the bag, I told them that was entirely too long. Their main source of contention was that the package carried by Oswald was shorter than the brown paper bag. The bag was just long enough to store the rifle in its disassembled state, so if the package carried by Oswald was much shorter, then it could not have contained the rifle. Hmm. Except, Randall saw it briefly at a distance through a window, while Fraser never paid it much attention. Did it look to you as if there was something heavy in the package? Well, I'll be frank with you, I didn't pay much attention to the package. In fact, the length of the package seemed about as certain to Fraser as his lack of attention to it. I didn't pay much attention. I didn't pay too much attention. I didn't pay any attention to it. I didn't pay much attention to the package. I didn't look at the package very much. Like I say, I didn't pay that much attention to it. I didn't pay too much attention to how he carried the package at all. <laughs> so many times. The tape and paper with which the brown paper bag had been constructed matched the tape and paper used to wrap books for shipping on the first floor of the Book Paul story. Not only that, but a fingerprint and palm print matching that of Oswald were also found on the mm -hmm. bag. Yeah, sounds about right. In spite of all this, some authors refuse to accept that the brown paper bag and the package carried by Oswald mm -hmm. were one and the same. Instead, the argument tends to be that the bag was fabricated by authorities in an effort to frame Oswald. But you then have to square that against no curtain rods being found inside the Book to Paul story, yep. Oswald already having curtains in his rented room in Dallas, him failing to obtain permission from his landlady to redecorate, him supposedly being in such urgent need of curtain rods that he just had to return to Irving on Thursday instead of waiting just one more day, him neglecting to mention anything about curtain rods to his wife and Ruth yep. Payne upon his arrival, and that's despite the fact that Payne actually had some spare curtain rods in her garage. The same garage where Oswald stored his rifle. I mean, however you look at it, while it's not definitive, for, for, for CSIs, we don't like, we don't necessarily like to use the words never and always and definitive. We, we like to say least likely, most likely, we, we use terms like those. It is highly likely that that bag, because here's the thing, is that not a lot of people paid attention to it, if at all. So there really isn't a lot of evidence against that the those two bags not being one and the same but also given that there's no evidence of curtain rods anywhere no matter how you look at it it is highly likely based on all the circumstantial evidence and even some actual evidence itself that that bag was what carried the rifle and that that morning when he was carpooling with his neighbor with Frazier that bag went in the back seat of Fraser's car, it had the rifle and any other necessary components, and that he brought it inside, and nobody batted an eye, because nobody thought it was weird. Like, they, they, they might have taken notice of it, but either they didn't question it, or they didn't, or they did, but they didn't pay much attention to it. So, again, most of it is circumstantial, but it is highly likely that th that that bag is one and the same. The same garage where Oswald stored his rifle. How did you learn of the shooting of President Kennedy? I was watching television and Ruth said someone had shot at the president. What did you say? It was uh, hard for me to say anything. We both turned pale. I went to my room and cried. Did you think immediately that your husband might have been involved? No. Did Mrs. Payne say anything about the possibility of your husband being involved? No, but she only said that, by the way, they fired from the building in which Lee is working. My heart dropped. I then went to the garage to see whether the rifle was there, and I saw that the blanket was still there, and I said, thank God. Did you look in the blanket to see if the rifle was there? 
I didn't unroll the blanket. It was in its usual position, and it appeared to have something inside. Hmm. When did you learn that the rifle was not in the blanket? When the police arrived and asked whether my husband had the rifle, and I said yes. Then what happened? They began to search the apartment. When they came to the garage and took the blanket, I thought, well, now they will find it. They opened the blanket, but there was no rifle there. Well, that's interesting testimony. Wow. So wait. So initially, Payne and Marina had no inclination to think that Oswald was behind it. Was behind was had any had had any involvement in this whatsoever, but as soon as Payne said something about the shots were fired from were possibly or definitely fired from the building where Lee was working, why is it only then that Marina had a suspicion of sorts in the back of her mind enough that she went to check the garage for the for the rifle, and why would Payne bring that up? Like, why, why, would, why wouldn't she say it was probably fired from the depository and, you know, not fired from the building that Lee worked in? That's interesting due to its abruptness. Huh. Around the time of the rifle's discovery on the sixth floor of the book depository, Captain William Fritz was appraised of Oswald's absence. Fritz immediately left the building and returned to police headquarters. Sorry if I'm eating. I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of hungry. Standing in the hallway when Captain Fritz walked in, he walked up to my colleagues and made the statement to them: "Go get a search warrant and pick up a man named Lee Oswald." And I asked the captain why he wanted him, and he said, "Well, he was employed down at the book depository, and he had not been present for a roll call of employees." And we said, "Captain, we will save you a trip." Because there he sits. <laughs> wow, damn. <laughs> nice. The alibis. Oh yeah, that's right, because he, he did potentially have some weird alibis. After escaping the book to Paul story, Oswald boarded a bus right about here. But the assassination ground traffic to a halt, so Oswald soon left the bus and hailed a cab. After returning to his rooming house in Oak Cliff, a neighborhood in southwestern Dallas, Oswald changed his clothes, grabbed a gun, and left in a hurry. Oh yeah. You are in Oak Cliff area, are you not? The line's been moved. You will be at Mars. Bring a mercy to come down. Final radio Police calls. Police patrolman J.D. Tippett encountered Oswald some 45 minutes after the shooting, a bit further south, right about here. As soon as Tippett stepped out of the vehicle, oh yeah, that's Oswald right, drew his gun and fired four shots in rapid succession. That's right, Oswald did shoot a gun, and 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 killed a killed a police officer. Yep, that's right. He did shoot and kill an officer. Oswald was then caught sneaking into a nearby movie theater without <laughs> purchasing a ticket. <laughs> theater of all places. A large contingent of officers descended upon the theater. They surrounded the building, switched on the lights, and approached the suspect. Flanked by officers, Oswald drew a gun and a brief scuffle ensued. But this time, he was quickly subdued, handcuffed, and taken to police headquarters back in downtown Dallas. Yep. Over the next two days, between his arrest and untimely death, Lee Harvey Oswald was interrogated by members of the Dallas Police, FBI, Secret Service, among others. <laughs> None of it was recorded. Did you have any Why? tape recorders? No, sir. I don't have a tape recorder. We need one. If we had one at this time, we could have handled these conversations far better. A police station the doesn't police doesn't have one. Doesn't have one. No. What? No, sir. I have requested one several times, but so far they haven't got me one. Oh lord. So no one knows exactly what was said inside this room. Instead, we have to settle for the cliff notes 
and of especial interest to us is Oswald's alibi. These people say? have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. You just heard uh, Oswald who said he did not shoot anybody. Oswald vehemently denied any involvement in the assassination. <laughs> Instead, he claimed to have eaten lunch with two co-workers on the first floor of the book depository. One of them was a black co-worker whose name Oswald could not recall. The other was James Jarman. Were you with what? anybody when you were what? walking around on the first floor finishing what? your sandwich? No, I wasn't. I was trying to get through so I could get out on the street. Did you see Lee Oswald? No, I didn't. After his arrest, he stated to a police officer that he had had lunch with you. Did you have a lunch with him? No, sir. I didn't. But according to another interrogator, Oswald's claim was not to have eaten lunch with the Jarman and this unnamed co-worker, but merely that he saw them pass through the lunchroom while he was eating. Oswald stated that he had eaten lunch in the lunchroom at the Texas School Book Depository alone, mm -hmm. but recalled possibly two black employees walking through the room during this period. Hmm. He stated, possibly, one of these employees was called Junior, and the other was a short individual whose name he could not recall, but whom he would be able to recognize. Hmm. So, according to this version of events, Oswald's alibi was that he possibly saw two co-workers, one whose name he could not recall, enter and traverse the lunchroom, together or separately, during an unspecified period of time. Yeah. Whether Oswald claimed to have eaten lunch with or in proximity of his colleagues, it makes no difference because neither alibi could be substantiated. Nope. Instead, James Jarman had last seen Oswald taking an elevator upstairs sometime between half past 11 and 12 o'clock. William Shelley and Eddie Piper had last seen Oswald roaming about the first floor around noon, at which time Oswald had told Piper that he was either going out or going up to eat lunch. Then there's the account of Charles Givens. You may recall that Givens is officially recognized as the last person inside the book depository known to have seen Oswald before the assassination. Yep, Their encounter I remember was that. fixed at 11.55 and is supposed to have taken place on the sixth floor. But prior to relating this version of events, Givens had reportedly told the FBI that he saw Oswald on the first floor at 11.50, a statement which he later denied ever making. Hmm. Either way, Oswald being on the first floor at noon does absolutely nothing to prevent him from being on the sixth, half an hour later. True, it doesn't. Unless Carolyn Arnold is to be believed. As Mrs. Arnold was standing in front of the building, she stated she thought she caught a fleeting glimpse of Lee Harvey Oswald standing in the hallway between the front door and the double doors leading to the warehouse located on the first floor. She could not be sure that this was Oswald, but she said she felt it was and believed the time to be a few minutes before 12.15 p.m. Okay. So that would be about here. In right. a subsequent statement, Arnold claimed to have gone outside as late as 12.25, thereby pushing the time of her potential ground floor sighting of Oswald as close as five minutes before the shooting. Right. Putting aside the fact that her observation was described as a fleeting glimpse and that she could not be certain of the man's identity, yep. Arnold herself will later deny it ever happened. That is completely foreign to me. It would have forced me to have been turning back around to the building when, in fact, I was trying to watch the parade. Why would I be looking back inside the building? That doesn't make any sense to me. Instead, Arnold claimed that this encounter yep. had actually taken place in the second floor lunchroom. I do not recall that Oswald was doing anything. I just recall that he was sitting there in one of the booth seats on the right-hand side of the room as you go in. He was alone, as usual, and appeared to be having lunch. I did not speak to him, but I recognized him clearly. Okay. The problem with both of these accounts is that none of her colleagues reported anything remotely similar. Whether it was the first or second floor, Oswald was apparently invisible to everyone but Arnold. Besides, it took Arnold huh. 15 years to relate her revised version of events. Right. Not ideal for such a time-sensitive issue. No. That being said, depending on what conspiracy theory you're willing to entertain, <laughs> there are ways to interpret what Oswald told his interrogators so that it aligns with either one of Arnold's accounts. Take this one, for instance. Oswald stated he was present for work at the book depository on the morning of November the 22nd yep. and at noon went to lunch. He went to the second floor to get a Coca-Cola and returned to the first floor to eat lunch. Then he went outside to watch the presidential parade. This claim is interesting because in the early days of the assassination, it appeared to be supported by photographic evidence. 
but is this figure was quickly identified as Billy Lovelady, a man who bore such a close resemblance to Oswald that when footage of Oswald first appeared on television, yep. Lovelady's Kinda. stepchildren thought it was him. Now, speaking only yeah, for myself, it does look a bit here, closer to Love Lady than Oswald. Am I missing something here? Because they're not exactly doppelgangers. No, right? not really. A anyway, in recent years, another such figure, this time with even fewer pixels to work with, has once again been the subject of debate. Because this much of a person can't be positively identified, some no. believe it, therefore, it must be Oswald. Uh, On the other I don't hand, know. Oswald explicitly denied watching the motorcade when he spoke with another interrogator. Not to mention that his presence outside went completely unnoticed by all those who did watch the motorcade. Now, yep. there's one final account of Oswald's <laughs> supposed alibi that stands out from the rest. It stands out because it really skirts the line of self-incrimination. Oh, jeez. When asked as to his whereabouts at the time of the shooting, Oswald stated that when lunchtime came and he didn't say which floor he was on, he said one of the black employees invited him to eat lunch with him. And he stated, you go on down and send the elevator back up and I will join you in a few minutes. Before he could finish whatever he was doing, he stated the commotion surrounding the assassination took place. And when he went downstairs, a policeman questioned him as to his identification and his boss stated that he is one of our employees. Whereupon the policeman had him uh -oh. step aside momentarily. Following this, he simply walked out the front door of the building. If this is an accurate recollection of what Oswald said, he placed himself on a floor above the second at the time of the shooting. He did. While he neglected to mention which floor, he described a conversation between himself and an unnamed black co-worker, which sounds remarkably similar to the one described by Charles Givens. Yeah. This would mean that Oswald, seemingly by accident, placed himself on the sixth floor during the shooting. Oh, After that snap. horribly confusing mishmash of stories, <laughs> what have we learned? Well, Oswald appears to have contradicted himself by offering multiple alibis. It's yep. also possible that what he said was misunderstood or otherwise misrepresented by the it's interrogation. Especially since there's no audio recording. As mentioned at the beginning of all this, we don't actually know what Oswald said. This is all based on second-hand accounts related days, weeks, or even months after the assassination. Yep. But the main takeaway has to be the lack of corroboration. With the exception of Carolyn Arnold, a highly unreliable witness, no one laid eyes on Oswald between roughly noon and the shooting. True. At least, no one inside the Book DePaul story. Oh, no one inside? Wait, what, what about outside the deposit of what? Hold up, this, this ought to be interesting. Among those who witnessed the sniper in the sniper's nest, Howard Brennan was the only one who thought he could identify the gunman. At least, that's what he stated initially. Within a few hours of the shooting, Brennan had become far less certain. <laughs> Upon arrival at the police station, Mr. Brennan said, I don't know if I can do you any good or not, because I've seen the man that they have under arrest on television. And he said, I just don't know whether I can identify him positively or not. Because he oh said boy. that the man on television was a bit disheveled and his shirt was open or something like that. And he said, the man I saw in the book depository was not in that condition. Brendan was then brought down to the basement of the police station after, though, wasn't it? to view a lineup of suspects. Among them mm. was Oswald. Mr. Brennan looked very carefully and he said, I cannot positively say. I said, well, is there anyone there that looks like the man in the book depository? All of them. He said, well, that second man from the left, who was Oswald, he looks like him. Then he repeated that the man he saw in the book depository was not disheveled. This is also so a few days that's later. That's not ideal. While Brennan did pick Oswald from a lineup, True. that identification was far from certain. But if Brennan is to be believed, this uncertainty was not genuine, but merely an act intended to protect his family. I believed at that time, and I still believe, the assassination was a communist activity. Oh. I felt like there hadn't been more than one eyewitness. And if it got to be a known fact that I was an eyewitness, my family or I, either one, might not be safe. Well, if you wouldn't have identified Oswald during the lineup, might he not have been released by the police? No, I already knew they had the man for murder, and I knew he would not be released. The murder of whom? Of Officer J.D. Tippett. 
Well, what happened in between to change your mind that you later decided to come forth and tell the FBI that you could identify him? After Oswald was killed, I was relieved quite a bit that, uh, as far as pressure on myself of somebody not wanting me to identify anybody, there was no longer that immediate danger. Okay. Mr. Brennan, could you tell us now whether you can or cannot positively identify the man you saw in the sixth floor window as the same man that you saw in the police station? I could at that time. I could, with all sincerity, identify him as being the same man. Okay. Because, l- l- let me think about this. This is in the 60s. This had to have been right around the time of the Cold War. The Cold War lasted about 45 years. No, I don't think it was that long. Maybe it was kind of that long. Holy shit. Okay, so, yeah. 60s probably would have been... 60s and 70s would have been right around the height of the Cold War. So, I mean, yeah. Because the Cold War is is just called that for a reason. We're, we're not gonna actually, like, attack each other. We're not gonna use our nukes. We're gonna keep it chill. Really chill. Really cold and just, uh, spy on each other a bunch. I mean, you had so many Russian communist spies and a KGB agents who were making their way into American government. Like, sneak- like, sneaking in. And kind of the same with the Americans, although... There, I think there were fewer instances of Americans sneaking into Russian positions or Russian civilian positions or some, something along those lines. But it was essentially a period of Russia, the, of communist Russia and capitalist America spying on each other endlessly because they could and they wanted to. So, I mean, the idea that, because, you know, it, it is true, Oswald did identify himself as a Marxist. Whether he was a Marxist or a communist, I can't necessarily say for sure, but he did identify with a governmental identity that's much more similar to Russia than it is to America. So, I could understand Brennan's hesitation to that, given the time period and given the information that he knew. I mean, you know, you, 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 you just tell the American government Oh, my neighbor, my neighbor did this. I think they're a communist and they would probably get held trial and sentenced that day or some nonsense like that. But I mean, Americans and Russians could do uh, some nasty things to each other during the Cold War. I mean, some real potential monsters out there. So yeah, I can, I can kind of understand Brendan's hesitation on that front. At least until Oswald was positively killed. I could at that time, I could with all sincerity, identify him as being the same man. So, according to Brennan, within a few hours of the assassination, he'd become concerned that it was the product of a communist conspiracy. He feared that should he attempt to identify the gunman, he could become a target and thereby endanger his family. Yep. Did you and your wife discuss any aspect of the assassination, and you being present, more or less, at the scene of the assassination? Yes, we discussed it. We talked. I talked of moving her and my grandson, who was living with us at that time, and my daughter. Moving them out of town somewhere in secrecy. My wife seemed to think that a person can't get away wherever they go. So when Brandon was brought down to view a lineup later that evening, he feigned uncertainty to protect his family. At least, Fair. so he claimed. I leave it up to you to decide whether to believe or disbelieve Brennan's story. Whether it's true or not, On it's Sunday still plausible. Morning, November the 24th, Oswald was scheduled for transfer from the city to the county jail. Here we Reporting go. From outside the police station, a local news correspondent couldn't help but to jinx the whole shebang. Now this is the armored truck that will carry Lee Harold Oswald. <laughs> from Lee the basement Harold. here of Dallas Police Headquarters downtown to the Dallas County Sheriff's Office and the Dallas County Jail. Strict security precautions have been exercised from the very beginning and have been even increased this morning as fear arises and grows stronger that someone may attempt to take the life of the man accused of murdering the President of the United States. Yep. 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 
The doctors at Parkland Hospital said that the single shot could scarcely have done more damage to a body than that shot did to Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. It penetrated his spleen, his pancreas, the aorta, the kidney, and the liver. Oswald single shot expired at 107 p.m. <laughs> he expired. <laughs> he died at 107 p.m. I'm sorry, that's funny. We have arrested the man. The man will will be charged with murder. Who is he? The man the suspect's name is Jack Rubenstein, I believe. He goes by the name of Jack Ruby. That's all I have to say. I'm still laughing at the expired. This is a fun beat. Throughout this video, we've encountered witnesses who not only contradicted each other, but also themselves. Yeah. Central to many arguments of conspiracies that these contradictions represent attempts by the conspirators to conceal the truth. Huh. Uh, to give you an example, Charles Gibbons initially claimed to have seen Oswald on the first floor at 11.50. Then, he denied ever saying that and claimed to have spoken with Oswald on the 6th floor at 11.55. Some authors have found this change a bit too convenient and suspected Gibbons was coerced to change his story by the conspirators. In support of that conclusion, we have this document in which Dallas Police Lieutenant Jack Revel said the following. Lieutenant Revel stated that Gibbons had been previously handled by the Dallas Police Department on a marijuana charge and he believes that Gibbons would change his story for money. About hmm. two months later, Givens did precisely that. He changed his story. But let's have a think about this. According to this interpretation of events, the conspirators had free reign to dictate Givens' testimony. They could have told him what to say or perhaps rewritten his testimony after the fact. Hmm. You may recall that that is precisely what Victoria Adams claimed and Carolyn Arnold implied earlier in the video. That hmm. someone had put words in their mouth by altering the written record. Okay, so wielding that near limitless True. power, what words did the conspirators choose to put in the mouth of Givens? Well, they supposedly invented a brief conversation about lunch in elevators, away from the sniper's nest, more than half an hour before the shooting. I guess I saw Oswald sitting in the sniper's nest, or even I saw Oswald carrying a large package heading for the sniper's nest, was a bit too on the nose. The same is of course true of every other true. witness in Dealey Plaza. Apart from the doubtful identification by Howard Brennan, no one can actually place Oswald in the sniper's nest at the time of the shooting. I really true. cannot stress this enough. It apparently did not occur to the conspirators to have at least one witness unambiguously identify Oswald as the assassin. Better yet, take a photograph. For all this talk of witness coercion and evidence tampering, that, that seems like a bit of an oversight. What I'm trying to illustrate is that True. it's surprisingly trivial to pluck a stray document here, an unfounded allegation there, and sprinkle in some thoughts about means and motive, and you'll end up with a conspiracy theory that, at least on the surface, sounds convincing. Whether it's organized crime, a foreign government, or domestic agency, mm -hmm. there's enough material here to make a compelling case against countless groups and individuals something upon which many authors, filmmakers, and others have capitalized to great success. Oh, yeah. I don't know if all of them are right or wrong. This video clearly doesn't cover enough ground for me to determine that. <laughs> but to ascribe a conspiratorial motive to anything remotely suspicious seems irresponsibly black and white for a case so clouded by shades of Yes, it does. <laughs> a person acting in a way that's unlawful, unethical, untruthful does not prove they colluded in a plot to assassinate the President of the United States. Such thrilling leaps oh, yeah. of conspiracy make for entertaining stories, but that doesn't make them true. Remember Thomas Allier? He was the journalist filming on the sixth floor during the initial search for the assassin. Decades later, Allier began accusing officers of tampering with the evidence, staging photographs, and lying on their oath. The veracity of those allegations aside, the fascinating thing about Allier is that he never believed Kennedy fell victim to a conspiracy. 
Ollier had a refreshing, really? nuanced take on the assassination by recognizing that evidence of corruption is not the same as evidence of conspiracy. That is Sloppy true. Police work neither began nor ended with the Kennedy assassination, and people lie for all sorts of reasons. Loyalty, embarrassment, fear, pride, attention, power, money. Th there's no shortage of motivations to choose from. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Besides, what kind of clueless masterminds would allow a cameraman to casually film their supposed cover? <laughs> yeah, that's a big point for sure. Something I found myself doing a lot while making this video was attempting to view the assassination from the perspective of the alleged conspirators. You could, for instance, question the logic of placing an assassin in this specific window. A window in which he ran the risk of being caught red-handed by other workers inside the building. A window in which he could have easily been and actually was spotted by spectators in the approaching motorcade. A window from which his view was partially obstructed by a tree. That is true. Oh, yeah. You can also question the logic of using a sniper to shoot at the moving target in the first place, especially when that person had a tendency to stand still in very exposed public places. If Oswald right. acted alone yeah. and assassination was a crime of opportunity, these less than ideal choices start to make a lot more sense. He found himself at the right place at the right time, had mere days to prepare, and used the only building to which he had access. But for a group of conspirators to handicap their own assassination plot requires a bit more ingenuity to explain. Oh, he yeah. <laughs> was a Pepsi, he was supposed to get caught, there were multiple assassins, you, you know the drill. Oh, yeah. But there's yeah, so yeah. much of that in this case. So much had to go just right for a conspiracy and the subsequent cover-up to succeed. Yep. From the roundabout process by which Oswald was hired at the book deposit yep. to the selection of the motorcade route. Yep. From Oswald's narrow escape and subsequent arrest to him mm -hmm. being given multiple chances to speak with the press. From the supposed tampering, suppression, and planting of evidence, to dozens of expert witnesses being successfully fooled or coaxed to lie under oath. Not only would a plan as complex and prolonged as this one have been difficult to predict with countless points of failure, but it seems, and excuse my language here, a bit overkill. Yes, oh, yeah. Kennedy was the president oh, of the definitely. United States, but he was not exactly difficult to access. He was rather famous for abandoning his Secret Service detail and wandering off into crowds. In yep. fact, that's precisely what he did on multiple occasions during this very trip. Now, decided yep. to shake hands with one or two more people, but this is the moment where the Secret Service has its point of tension. They say, when the president stops moving, that's when we're concerned, because that is when the possibility of trouble comes to the forefront. <laughs> yeah. One of moments for which President Kennedy is so well known so many times you have heard that the Secret Service men suddenly find themselves without the president, that suddenly he has left them and stepped into the crowd and decided to shake hands and give his personal greetings. You could say perhaps that this is more the norm now than the unexpected because it has been done so many times. As this yeah, Kennedy was not was subtle. To just a few minutes before the actual shooting, all it takes is one person with a gun at point blank range. Yep. Not unlike the shooting of Oswald. <laughs> Think about yep. that the next time you watch a documentary or read one of the thousands of books implicating members of the Secret Service, FBI, CIA, Dallas Police Department, politicians, lawyers, doctors, investigators, witnesses, and so forth. Think about how all these alleged co-conspirators did not have to be a part of any of this. Just one person in a crowd whose guilt is assured the moment they pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. By roping in this ensemble cast of characters, it inadvertently makes the conspirators seem clueless. Right. I like to imagine a conference room and up against the wall stands a board upon which they've mapped out the whole thing. Oh, all the yeah. people they need to manipulate, all the evidence they have to fabricate. The entire patchwork of needless risk-taking laid out bare before them. And they looked at that, and then looked at each other and went, Yep, that's a solid plan. <laughs> but even then, <laughs> even if we assume the conspirators didn't really think it through, or oh my gosh. made it up as they went along, that doesn't really jive with them not getting caught. Ooh. Something that would have taken a lot of planning, <laughs> skill, and ingenuity. So... I guess you somehow have to convince yourself that they were clueless enough to wing the crime of the century, yet clever enough to get away with it. Yep.
and therefore there was no conspiracy. <laughs> no, I, I don't believe any of these arguments make it impossible for others to be involved. They just right. make it more difficult to keep that much more difficult in place. I mean, if there was an argument with which to close the book on this case, I would not be the first to think of it nearly six decades and a continent removed from the events in question. <laughs> I can guarantee you that much. Also, the word conspiracy doesn't even necessarily mean that there were other people involved in the planning and execution. Of the that is very, that was very this true. This is what some refer to as a benign conspiracy. This typically means that there was a cover-up, but it was not motivated by the concealment of complicity, as is so often assumed. Instead, Oswald did act alone, but there was some other motive behind the suppression of evidence. A common one being that federal agencies attempted to save face by concealing well, that or back up real quick. motivated by the concealment of complicity, as is so often assumed. That's Instead, why their Oswald voices all sounded similar. Alone, okay, I'll talk about that in a moment. motive behind the suppression of evidence. A common one being that federal agencies attempted to save face by concealing or downplaying the full extent of their failure to prevent the assassination. I mean, a known communist with ties to Russia, blindsiding the entire intelligence community by assassinating the commander-in-chief on a public street in broad daylight at the height of the Cold Sounds War. Sounds really far-fetched. Exactly resume material. No. Point being that there are countless ways to interpret the evidence in a case as vast as this one. I am not exaggerating when I say that you could easily make dozens of these videos and still have plenty left to talk about. Oh yeah. After all, the Texas School Book to Paul story is but one piece of a much larger puzzle. Oh yeah, he didn't Thanks even touch the magic bullet. Okay, okay, bye. <laughs> wow. Yeah, of all the talk about the actual shooting and all the information related to the depository, he didn't even talk about the bullets themselves. Wow. I can see now how he managed to make an hour and a half of that. Holy mo- there were- I knew that there were a lot of moving parts. There were so many more moving parts than I initially suspected. Okay, so here's something interesting. We have we have people voicing. Okay, so these weren't actual audio recordings, but let me know brought in a few individuals who would voice various individuals and essentially read out their testimony. That's why many of them sounded similar or identical to one another. I thought that that seemed weird. I was gonna make a random comment about it, like, oh, what was the this, this, this all sounded like the same guy, or, you know, they all sound- how can they all sound the same, or something to that effect? I was thinking it earlier, I just didn't actually make a comment on it. I wonder if I could identify the exact clip I'm thinking about where I wanted to mention it. Probably not, but that's fine. Okay, so these aren't actual- okay, but the videos are real, and any of the audio associated with the videos are definitely real. But the audio testimonies are not. They're voiced by a few different individuals. Got it. Okay, I'm 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 with it. That makes that makes a lot more sense. That is still really cool that he decided to go more of an audio testimony, audio testimonial kind of route for this video. I like that because in a way it actually makes sense. There were so many different testimonies and conflicting stories that were happening throughout the entirety of this video. Again, I did not realize how many moving pieces there actually were at the time of the assassination. Wow. And let me know is absolutely right. If you take all of this information together, and, th and this doesn't even account for all of it, this only accounts for a portion of it, a pretty substantial portion, but not the entire portion, obviously. But if you take so many of the components, so many things had to go both right and wrong for a conspiracy to have ever taken place. I didn't know the information, all the information, obviously, at the beginning of this video, but even I knew that the idea of a conspiracy just sounded ridiculous. I mean, not just for the whole magic bullet theory issue, but e e even the general issue that there was a large group behind this. I did say at the beginning of the video that I, with limited information, thought that Oswald acted alone, or he maybe had one accomplice. Having reached the end of the video, I am confident that Oswald acted alone, which I'm pretty sure was my first inclination anyways. So, I, so my opinion really did not change, but now I have a lot more information, 
And yeah, knowing all knowing all this information, not even all of it, again, just a lot of it. Even knowing this all this information, the conspiracy theory ideas just sound that much more ridiculous. Uh, granted, there were some issues. There were conflicting testimonials for sure, and conflicting stories even from individuals who were supposedly in the same area around the same time. Some of the biggest problems with this is that there wasn't a solid timeline. There was a general idea of the timeline, but up until maybe like half an hour before the assassination itself, at least down to the minute for sure, there was no solid timeline. I, he, I mean... There, there, there are so many possibilities in so many of these different scenarios as well. Uh, j just look at the stairwell. You know, w with people, no, we left seconds after the shots rang out. No, it might have actually been minutes. Granted, I, I, I think I've said my, I've, I've sprinkled my thoughts about what felt most likely to me. But could I put it all together? No, because that was a lot of information. So just go back and re-listen to any of that. I'm not about to go through the whole story of what I think is most likely because I don't remember all the details. <laughs> and I might accidentally confuse myself with uh, various story aspects. So, And I don't want to do that. Yes, there were some errors. And, and, and the testimonies and the conflicting stories are just one of the errors. There was definitely some evidence tampering as well. I'm pretty confident that a lot of it was unintentional, if not all of it. Definitely a, a bigger majority or all of the evidence tampering that definitely did or could have happened was unintentional. Because, eh, let me know it's absolutely right. If, if you're really trying to pull off a conspiracy this freaking big in terms of Dozens upon maybe even hundreds, okay, probably not hundreds, but definitely tens upon dozens of witnesses have to get paid off or they have to get coerced or something like that. We're talking multiple detectives and police officers and FBI agents and and just, just so many people that would have to get fooled. Well, okay, for, to be fair, a lot of people did get fooled or they exaggerated their own stories for various reasons. Or they just simply misremembered stuff. Evidently. They were, they, some people were even interviewed decades later. You really expect that people are going to remember that kind of stuff? I mean, sure, I remember little things, but when you're talking about trying to put together a solid story or timeline that makes sense, and you only decide to interview people decades later, there's going to be some misinterpretations, there's going to be people who misremember things, there's going to be people who flat out don't remember stuff, or they completely change their story. There's so many unknown factors and biases at play, if you're going to do it that way. Absolutely. And then, of course, I got a little bit heated with some of the, um, yeah, w w with some of the potential evidence tampering. Because there was definitely some blatant mishandling on the side of law enforcement and detectives. That much is obvious. And that frustrates me. <laughs> but this is also in the 60s, so I, I can't say I'll let it slide, because I don't want to. But it is a slight bit more understandable. Because there weren't really... Ev evidence collection techniques had definitely not solidified by that point. They have nowadays. Yeah, it's, it's much stricter now. Much significantly more stricter. <laughs> much significantly more strict. Separate those two. Much? No, just take it out. Significantly more strict. Yeah, that was... That was... That was a veritable butt ton of information. Holy crap on a cracker. Man, let me know did it again. Abs he absolutely did it again. I still think that the Jack the Ripper video is still my favorite, but this one was really solid too. This one definitely took an angle that I think a lot of people have not taken before, because I feel like most people do focus in on Oswald himself, or they focus on you know, the, 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 the opposing, the, oh, maybe not opposing, but the differing viewpoints between Oswald and Kennedy, the assassination itself, 
and the, the whole magic bullet theory. Those are definitely the big points that most people will hone in on, and of course the conspiracy as well. But to, but to look at it from the depository is a really interesting stance, and definitely not one I, well, obviously one I haven't seen, but also definitely one I've not heard either. I did not realize how complex of a situation it was in the depository. But, oh man, this was, this was all really good information. So, overall, my opinions have not changed. I'm now much more confident that Oswald acted alone. I am significantly more confident, as if I wasn't already, that there's no freaking conspiracy happening. I didn't even touch... Let me know and I... Oh, well, okay, I did a smidge. But let me know didn't even touch the magic bullet theory, which honestly, given that this was focused on the depository, does actually make sense. And I'm actually kind of glad he didn't touch that. That would have been a whole other can of worms. But I, I, I touched it a little bit, and I thought that the whole magic bullet theory was nonsense as well. I'm pretty sure most people at this point have, have thought it's nonsense. I don't know how many people still think that the Kennedy assassination was conspiracy, though. But they're all, even in the depository alone, there are so many moving pieces. It is absolutely insane. But I can follow it. I was even remembering some details that I had seen 40-50 minutes beforehand. And granted, that, that's a very short period of time compared to literal days or weeks. But, Let Me Know has always been able to present these videos in a way that especially I can grasp. Stuff that I can understand and elaborate on coming from a forensic perspective who's much more familiar with stuff on the detective front, on the CSI front, and even, in a way, on from the law enforcement front. I am a lot more familiar with some of this stuff. So I can definitely provide a more in-depth analysis and understanding of what's going on here, what should have happened, what did or didn't happen, and how all these moving parts connect to one another. That, it, 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 I wouldn't say it's second nature to me. It really isn't because I haven't had professional experience with it yet, or career experience, but I do have a logical enough mind and I do have enough training and education that I'm able to recognize certain things that I feel like most people wouldn't. But I can see, I can see all these dots connecting. And I'll, I'll, I, I can see how some of them might connect to one another. I can see how they would connect to other points. And... I, I just, I, I'm able to make sense of it all in my head. I'm not confused. I'm surprised by the complexity, but I'm not confused. I can tell you that much. That was a fantastic video. And I also love that, you know, Let Me Know was still talking even as his patrons are going through. So that, that just, that just makes you want to listen to him a little bit longer, especially if you've seen the video all the way up to the credits. You might as well listen to the credits because he's still talking about a few things and, you know, essentially calling the uh, conspiracy theorists kind of dumbasses. I'm pretty sure that's what I was doing. I mean, in all honesty, he's not really off the mark. I mean, from the depository standpoint and information alone, it's silly to assume that there was a conspiracy related to this stuff. It's, it's as simple as a man with a different viewpoint and a gun and access to the building that would have allowed him to properly assassinate the president without too much of us that's just how that's just that's just how it goes that's really how it goes so yeah good good job good job let me know that was that was ridiculously informative i can see why the video is as long as it is very complex but not very confusing I hope other people are not confused by what Let Me Know was saying or by what I was adding into it as well. That was such a good video, though. I hope people are really happy with this uh, analysis and commentary because <laughs> I was really looking forward to this and I know that other people will as well. I think somebody suggested that I make this a two-parter and I'm like, nah, screw that. <laughs> I, was, I was really invested in this one in particular. So, hold up. I want to see how long this one is. <gasps> Three and a half hours. <laughs> oh my god! No shot, that's three and a half hours. Oh, oh specifically, it's like three hours and 36 minutes. Oh my word in heaven. <laughs>
<laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, that is, that is amazing. This is a single video that is well over double the length of the original video. Holy crap. Granted, I can probably take off five, maybe ten minutes of that. And that's still over double the length. Because the original video was about one hour and 35 minutes. One hour 36. Something like that. Which means I essentially had just under two hours of my own commentary to add. Okay, actually, take okay, may maybe take off just another 10 minutes just in case for all of the trouble I had thinking about specific words I wanted and about quickly researching. That's still... That's still like an hour 40, hour 45 minutes of commentary for me alone. Holy shnikes. Oh my god, I'm gonna have so much fun editing this. Holy shit. <laughs> this is gonna take me forever to edit, though. Good job, let me know. Good job. Good job. Solid job. That was, uh, that was, that was, that was really good. That was... Holy crap. Holy crap on a cracker. That was, um... That was great. That was that 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 was amazing. Still love the Jack the Ripper one, but this one was really good too. This one was really good. I think I'm gonna do the same thing with my patrons. Don't let me know, did? Yeah, why not? I I I like that. I don't have nearly as many patrons as Let Me Know does, but that's 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 still that's still amazing. Oh holy crap! All right, I think I'm done.